I gave you my heart, don't tear it apart. I gave you my soul, don't leave a gaping hole. I don't know what to do. I think I'm falling for you. I gave you my heart, don't tear it apart. I gave you my soul, don't leave a gaping hole. Now I know what to do. I think I'm falling, I'm falling, I'm falling for you. Do you remember when we first met? I ask as I cannot forget, ask as I cannot go back. Think of all the times we had. Think of all the times we Do you remember when we first met? I showed up at your place around sunset. Start reminiscing, look from a distance, see you. Got what I'm missing back at all. Hello everyone, uh, this is Gramster Arthur Nations and I'm um, very happy to be back. Uh, I see there was a little counter. <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, on my way to my room, wasn't I? Right. Um, so, again, welcome to the... which bootcamp is it? 23rd bootcamp already? And by tradition... Once a week, I am doing some educational stuff, and uh, so that's what this bootcamp is about. I'm um, covering various interesting theoretical topics, and uh, today the topic is the pawn end games. Right. So if you know, if you wish to know and learn something better about the pawn end games, there you go. All right. So I guess we'll start with some basic examples. And uh, then slowly try to advance to something more uh, difficult and see how it will go from there. Alright. Um, okay, let me set up a position. Let's start with something basic. Yeah, so by the way, I'm gonna use this book, Dvoretsky Zengame Manual. And. Um, it's one of my favorite books and it contains a lot of uh, great examples and in terms of the pawn endgames it's something like 60 pages yeah last time I checked so let's set up something simple just a second I'll find an example I also by the way gather quite a lot of um, examples from my own games hope you're gonna appreciate them uh, okay, so the very basics, the very basics. Um, da -da 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 -da. Let's move the position. The king is going to be here. The pawn is going to be here, and the king is going to be here. Hey, Jim Five Congrat. Hello there. So, it's all about the opposition, and uh, many pawn end games will either tackle. Uh, direct opposition or distant opposition or have something about it so about this position I'm pretty sure all of you are already familiar with the basics but I believe we have to start with something right so here the, the thing is again if black is the move <laughs> if black is the move then then black loses so why is that because after king d7, king f6, king here, king here, that's the opposition. And either king f7, d6, d5, e5, e6, or... Oh, just a second, I should have set it up. I think I forgot to execute the command, just a second. Okay, here we go again. Pawn here, king here. Yeah, I guess I should just less... Uh, load, yeah, like this. Okay, and now king f7. Uh, king f7 is either king d6 and king d7 is king f6 and the king goes past either way yeah thank you guys for the hydrate of course i am really hydrated <laughs> appreciate that and why this position is a draw if white is the move because after king f5 king f7 the black king follows where the white king goes and after e5 e6 
the idea is very simple. You always go in front of the pawn. You don't have to guess. The rule is very simple. Oh, you spent your lightning. Okay. So the rule is very simple. Always retreat in front of the pawn. Don't not here, not here, and of course not here. So king e8. And uh, here, 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 and this leads to a stalemate. Right. Very simple, actually. And uh, of course, if uh, white doesn't do anything, let's say he's going to be try to be tricky. Just go back. Yeah, just go back and just go here in front of the pawn. Very simple rule. Always go back here, and finally, when the king joins, king of eight here, here, and that's a stalemate again. So again. Yeah, thank you guys for the hydrate. So again, this is quite a basic, simple rule, but it's gonna uh, follow many pawn endgames. So that's the opposition. So the only thing when the opposition doesn't really work, it's when the pawn is on the sixth rank already. So I'll, no, on the fifth rank, and the pawn for the defender is on the sixth rank. Sideward opposition. Sideward opposition. Can you mention me an example, an exea? Not sure I realize what is a sideward side sideward opposition. So let me show you this example. Um, let's say the pawn is here and pawn is here and king is here. Okay, that's good to hear. So, this position is lost. Yeah, black is losing. The reason is very simple. Again, we are going to go back to the basic opposition. So, again, let's say it doesn't matter who is to move. Let's say black is to move, doesn't matter. White is to move, doesn't matter. Here, 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 and here. Now, there is this major, um, major exception which you have to know about this particular endgame. Here, when the king is on the last rank already, this is losing. Why is that? Because the white king goes here, here, g6, g7, and now you see black is missing one more line to claim a draw. So he has to play king f7, king h7, and this is losing. So I'll compare with another example. For example, we had this position. We had this position. And it's losing. But for example, let me set up a very similar position. We are going to have the pawns not on g5 and g6, but on g4 and g5. Like this. It might seem it's exactly the same. It's not the same. It's absolutely, completely different position. So the difference is the pawns have been moved one line closer to white's rank. And this is a draw, easy draw. And again, black draws this position just because of the opposition. So again, the white king goes forward. King h6 doesn't really matter. You can just sacrifice this pawn. That's a king h6 here. And not the most important thing what you have to know is all about the opposition. So if you play king g7, this is a very bad move because after king takes on g5, you have some basic knowledge that this is a winning pawn end game for the stronger side because the king has to move hello lolly either here or here and the white king will go past it and this is winning so the correct defense is to play king h7 again with the idea that after king takes on g5 will be met with king g7 and this is opposition so the black king will follow the white king so for example the white king will go here the black king goes here here, 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 here. There is no progress. So this is all about the opposition, some basic stuff. And after g5, g6, black has this one more final line where he manages to force white into a stalemate. That's it. So white could try to be tricky. For example, here instead of the king takes on g5, he could play King of seven, uh, king of six. I apologize. King of six. Quite tricky. Inviting to play something like king h8, which by the way is still a draw. 
King h8 is still a draw as long as after king takes on g5, black plays king g7. White can be tricky, he can play king g6, king g8, king h6, doesn't matter, king f7, as long as after king g5, black plays king g7. Uh, hello, power slave. No, it's a draw, but it really depends where's the pawn. Let me show you some examples. Um, for example, let me show you... Uh, let's say the pawns are going to be here. And the position is going to be... Let's say this position. No, 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 no power slave. It doesn't have to do anything uh, with the A, B, G, and H files. It's all about is the pawn uh, up to the sixth rank or not. I mean, up to the fifth rank or not. So again, let me show you. So for example, this position or, or the pawns are here or here or here or here or here. Not, of course, with the A and H files. Those are usually the draw uh, lines. So... For example, here, again, the king is going to be... Oh, just a second. The king is going to be here and here. This is losing. Now black is losing this position. Yeah, the ranks are extremely important. Which rank is it? So, for example, it is black to move. doesn't matter. doesn't really matter because king c6 is going to be king f7, king d5, and king f6. So, why does the move here? Here. And despite the fact that black has managed to make an opposition, he is lacking one more file. If black makes the king opposition, uh, Sam Connolly, the outflanking becomes impossible. Yeah, talk to is imminent, so outflanking is impossible. So again, here, 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 and black is missing this ninth rank were to position the king to form an absolute opposition he doesn't have it in order to force the stalemate here here it's not because the pawn promotes so again let me show you the very same example but push those pawns one line back so again it's going to be the e pawn but the pawn on e4 and the pawn on e5 well, let's say the king is here and the king's here again the same example White goes king f6, so black has to remember, he has to force the opposition, otherwise he loses. So it's king d7, I can play tricks here, doesn't matter, inviting you to play king e7. You don't have to do that, just wait. This pawn is lost anyway. And after king takes on e5, king e7. And where the king goes, there the black king goes. If the king goes here, the black king goes here. So king d5. King d7, king e5, king e7, king e5, king f7, e5, king e7. And that's it. You already remember that the black king has always retreat in the same line of the pawn. So after e6, don't guess. It's not king d8, it's not king f8. It's always the same line of the pawn, king e8. King e8, I can show it. King f6, king f8 e7 here and here and this is extremely helpful uh what do you mean how that isn't right i mean it it is right i mean it's just just a drawing position so why this is so important um it's very rarely i mean you'll be playing the game and suddenly boom comes the spawn end game and you have to show an opposition Having knowledge of these pawn games is... How is that different? Yeah, because the defender is missing one more final rank. So, for example, if you would have this position, imagine, imagine he has no 8th rank. So that we are moving the entire pawns and kings one rank further. So here after e6, you cannot go to the last rank because it doesn't exist. So that's that's all the, all you need to know. So there is no last rank. So imagine the seventh rank is already the last rank, and you are forced to play king d6. Here, since you are placed only on the seventh rank, you go in front of the total 
direction of the pawn, you position the king e8, and after king f6, king f8, this is a draw. It forms a stalemate. And if the white king, if it doesn't go, if it doesn't go with a if white doesn't play e7, you just go back to the pawn. Uh, the sneaky line. Yeah, it's all about uh, playing around. Yeah, you, you can play it around and, um, uh, for example, uh, white, white can try to trick. Instead of this, he can play, not, in, not immediately e7, he can play king e5, uh, let's say king e7, king d5, king e8, king c6. Try to trick black to play, for example, here king d8 already is the losing move. So king d8, king d6, I fooled you. Completely fooled you. So the rule is very simple. Again, when you're on the defending side and you're facing this position, always retreat in front of the pawn when you have to retreat. So king e8, I'll say here, king e8. And if your opponent allows, always go back. If he allows, if he doesn't just face the opposition of the king. So this endgame is extremely simple. Once you will master it, it will allow you to divert, let's say, an unpleasant position to a pawn endgame, which you know for sure, which is either winning or it's drawish. Uh, there are some, some uh, exceptions to this basic endgame, and uh, usually it's the A or H pawns. Then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. For example, let's say we have the A pawn or H pawn. Black. I mean, not really black, but the defending side. He can do whatever he wants. I mean, whatever he wants. Just sit and never allow the pawn to promote. There is no idea. There is no uh, outflanking. The king remains in the corner. Yeah, this isn't... I apologize. Yeah, there's not going to be rook endgames. Uh, tone. I already did rook endgames. Maybe I'll return to it. You can check my... Um... My previous bootcamp I did uh, some time ago. It's uploaded to my YouTube channel. If you can, my, if you can find my YouTube channel uh, by exclamation mark YouTube, uh, one of the playlists is my bootcamps. So uh, just a second, maybe I'll just post it here for you. Okay, here it is. Yeah, thank you, Jim Five Hundred. Here it is. Here it is. So you can find the playlist, the bootcamps, and one of the very first bootcamps, maybe the very first one actually, was about Rook Endgames. Uh, Villas want Conquered Endgames? Yeah, I don't know the book. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I know, I know. I mean, it's very, very much... Um, this um, The Rescue is Endgame Mal, it's very, very much advanced. I know that, but... I mean, for professional like me, it's really helpful. I mean, maybe for uh, club level players, it's too difficult. But since I'm a, ch a professional chess player and um, I'm also coaching uh, students, I find it extremely, extremely helpful. So anyway, I mean, I can explain also the basic endgames without the book. So at the moment, I'm not even looking at the book. I just uh, remember this example. So this endgame with an A pawn or H pawn is just a draw. As long as you're sitting in the corner, it's always going to be stalemate. Always. Yeah, okay, okay. So this this is not really difficult stuff. And uh, so it's all about all about the opposition. Um, so for example, I could set you up a more difficult example. Yeah, this one I had a peek in the book. So for example, it's going to be with a pawn on b4, king on a fate, and king here. So here white is the move. And the question is, how do we win this position? Yeah, this is from the book. <laughs> this is from the book, okay. So this is from the book. So how do you win this? And you might think, wait a second, where's the big idea? I'll just want the king. But again, this example is extremely important. And it checks if you know the opposition. Or a5, subtafsha. Not only b5, but a5. I would say actually a5. 
So, for example, if I if I go directly, King D2, here, here, here. That's it. Drop. Easy. You just made a normal looking moves. This is easy draw because again, something like B5, King B7, a uh, King B6, King B4. Just always go in front of the pawn. Always meet the king. B6, king b7, always in front of the pawn. Direct side. Here, here, here. And still me. Yes, you need to outflank. Yes, you absolutely you need to outflank. So the right idea. So the right idea is to play king c2. King b3. King a4. And this is the so-called outflanking. You don't allow the opposition. And again, let's say if the opponent plays king c7. Here, the only accurate move. Which is winning. There's only one move. And you can find it if you recognize which positions are drawish and which are not. So king b5 is already a big mistake. King b5 allows black to make an opposition. This is a draw. We know this already. King b7 again, I'm, I'm sorry, b5 again allows to play king b7. And this is going to be easy draw. Yes, of course, king a6, of course. So it's king a6, king b8. And now about the last rank, you don't have to make an opposition. You don't have to do this. Because at the last rank, if the king is cut off, you're not obliged to make an opposition. You could... You could play king b6 and nobody is going to blame you. And this is correct approach, of course. Because let's say after king a6, uh, king a8, king c7, here, here, here. You'll figure it out. There is nothing better for you in any way. Instead of playing king b6, king a6, and b6. So this is why it was a much faster way after king a6, king b8, just play b5. Just play b6, and as long as the king is forced out, this is. Yes, an exia. Well said. Well said. Yeah. And this is this is a winning winning uh, endgame. So again, the idea. So the idea was to get quickly to a5, and if you get to a5, and the black king cannot make it to a7 as quickly. This is all about the opposition. And opposition is going to be extreme. I mean, it's not only going to be, it already is an extremely big topic in the pawn endgames. So this is one of the most basic uh, things which you have to understand about the pawn endgames. There is not only, um, not only the opposition, there is also the distant opposition, which I'm going to talk to you about. So distant opposition is going to be slightly more tricky. But still, this is quite easy. The most efficient way to convert the bishop and the pawn. I'm afraid that's not a, a topic of today. Bishop and pawn, it really depends which bishop, which pawn, and how far it wants the pawn is. I mean, there's some, some funny examples and funny exceptions about that, so I cannot really uh, say that all of them uh, really work. Um, okay, I can show you yet another example from the book, from Dvretsky's Endgame Manual. I have my own games as well, don't worry about it. Hey, Kinkia, thank you. Appreciate that. Nice to hear. So again, one more example from Dvretsky's Endgame Manual is going to be this lovely endgame. Now, this is actually a study. So the pawn is going to be G2, king going to be on F1, H5. And King C8. Now, this is a classic. I mean, everybody who has studied. Uh, you have it, Alberto. That's great. Yeah, that's one of my favorite books. I've read it, I don't know, a couple of times already. <laughs> Thank you, DR4. So here, white is the move. And again, this is going to be all about the opposition. So let's check some of the basic stuff. The first idea, which comes in my mind, white is the move. So it's all about who is going to make first to the h-pawn. Otherwise, if both kings make it at the same time to the g-pawn and h-pawn, it's just going to be a draw. So here we go. I'll play here. So let's imagine, let's imagine 
Black is to move. I mean, Black has to move, and he plays here. I go here, here. Hey, McBurnout! Thank you, thank you for the sub. Hope you appreciate the alert. <laughs> You're the first one to see it. So after King H6, King H4, here, and now this is going to be extremely tricky stuff. So here, here. Now let's be careful. Now let's be careful here. We can play King G5. It's okay. King H7. And again, let's remember the opposition. If you play immediately G4 just because the pawn can move by two squares, this is going to be a huge mistake. G4, King G7. This is opposition. Black has made an opposition. You have to move, and this is a drawing position. So the correct move here actually is G3. You force your opponent to play King G7. Now you play G4. He is in the opposition. He has to move. He is going to play whatever. I mean, King F7, then King H6, outflanking, King H7, King F6. A waiting move. Exactly. So this is already one great example that when in opponent games it was one of the uh, world, previous world champions, Michael Batvinik, he always said, be extremely careful about moving the pawns in opponent games by two squares immediately. Sometimes you can win extremely valuable time by just moving by one square. You don't have to push it by two squares. So there is another tricky move here, and this is extremely nice. But after king f2, black can play h4. He doesn't allow to be, uh, to, allow to be played king g3. And now comes the really, really tricky stuff. We recognize black's idea. If we know that any h and a pawn endgames are drawish, we recognize that after king f3, Black is not going to play king d7 because this is again going to be extremely easy winning endgame for white. Yes, you we must not take with a pawn. So after h3, we recognize the idea because g takes black just positions the king in the corner. And that's it. This is a draw. So what do we do? After h3, we're thinking, wait a second, I could play g4. I mean, in order to take the pawn as quickly as possible. Yes, that is a draw. This is also a draw. <laughs> also, this is a draw. Because after king d7, king e6, we just cannot jump into h5. If we would have the king on h5, like king h3, king h5, this is winning. Now, this is becoming a draw again. White made all of the normal looking moves. And yet, he spoiled the winning position. So where was the win? Let's go back. So the win was, after king f2, we already discovered that after king d7, king g3, king h4, king h5, white king manages to force upon black an opposition. So after h4, now comes the really beautiful move. King g1. And the difference is the black pawn is closer. This is the only move. The only move. So the black pawn is closer to the white king. And we can just play king g1, king h2, king h3. And now the again one important accuracy. If black plays h3, again we recognize we cannot take g takes on h3 because this is a draw shang game. We might play g4, but g4 is a big mistake, all again because of the opposition. And this is a draw. So the only move which wins is g3. g3 wins because after king d7, king e6, now we are forcing the opposition. King g6 is going to met by king g4. King f6. Now let's be extremely accurate. Let's not play king g4 because king g4, king g6 is an opposition. We have been forced an opposition. 
So it's all about who is going to be forced in opposition, we or black. So king h5. King f5 doesn't change anything. King g7. Let's play. Again, let's be extremely accurate. Why doesn't win with the other position with the king on f3? I already showed that. I, I showed that before. Because uh, black manages to put an opposition. So here again, it's extremely important to keep the opposition. So g4 would be a giant mistake. I mean, g4 forces king h7 is again opposition. King g5, king g7. So instead of that, we are going to keep opposition, king g5, king h7. And again, remember, g4, king g7, we are being forced on opposition. So we have to outflank. We play king f6. King h6 gives nothing, g4, king h7, g5. King goes, let's say, if king g8, we can already force an opposition. Hey, Jakob Kaki. King g6 and the outflanking starts. After king h6, here and here. Now the question is, did you understand that? So this is all about the opposition. So if you understand the basic principle of the opposition in the pawn endgames and you understand which positions you have to avoid at all costs, it's going to be so much easier for you. So you already should know by heart that having the pawn behind the king and king in front of it and your opponent is forced to move, this is a winning position. If you are the one to move, then this is a drawish position. And it's all about out flanking. Again, let's revisit this example. So first we realize that after h4, king f3, h3, g3, this is simply going to be, or g4, this is simply going to be a draw. So after h4, we play king g1, ready to outflank our opponent, and after h3, very accurately, very accurately, outflanking our opponent, outflanking, outflanking, extremely careful not to force upon us an opposition so we are still playing king g5 let's not allow the opposition and we play outflank and now we can safely play g4 and when the king is forced already to the last rank it doesn't matter it's either out outflanking or uh or just push forward the pawn Alrighty, so that was extremely nice. Um, I could show some funny examples. So, for example, uh, for example, let me set up another position of uh, another position of opposition. So, for example, let's say here. I should have already started it with it. So, the next thing we are going to talk about is the so-called I'm not gonna play blitz guys this is uh, boot camp learning stuff not gonna play blitz now so this example is all about the so-called mind squares so what is a mind square a mind square is as soon as one of the sides steps on that square he is losing something so for example mind square for white is of six because if you're gonna play king of six black is gonna play king d5 mind square for black is d5 because as soon as black is gonna position the king on d5 you're gonna play king of six yes f6 and d5 exactly exactly those are the mind squares so it's really all about who is to move and you have to force your opponent upon the mind square so the correct move I was already somebody wrote in the chat is you play king g6. King d5, we play king f6, we win. How to identify? 
How to identify? That's a very good question. Just imagine yourself. Uh, just imagine yourself um, a kind of position where you cannot go. Because if you're going to position the king on d5, you lose something immediately. I mean, you have to just recognize it yourself. You realize that this is a mind uh, square during the game. You cannot go there. And there sometimes... No, it's not... I mean, this is still a draw. It really depends who is to move. Really, if black is to move, this is a draw. If white is to move, white is winning. Uh, sometimes none of, the, none of the sides can move to the mind squares. I'm going to show you that example. But here, white wins. White wins. Because of king g6, king c5, trying to get here, but... This is the so-called Tsukzwang. Yes! So what is a Tsukzwang? Um, this is, I mean, uh, quite a big topic about the endgames and quite funnily, Tsukzwang or the so-called no moves is extremely rare in openings and middle games. So Tsukzwang is not really common and when there are so few pieces on the board then can arise this kind of moment when you don't want to move but you have to move. So here, for example, black would be easily drawing if he is going to say, I'm not going to move. I'm just going to sit and watch. But the rules of chess clearly dictate you have to move. You just cannot, like, press the clock. I mean, now it's your move, right? You have to move. You have to physically make a move. So this is what Tsukzwang is all about. And sometimes having a move has disastrous effects. So otherwise, I mean, every single pawn endgame, just position the king in front of the pawn, don't care about any kinds of oppositions, just stand there and do nothing, right? But you have to move. So that's why it's so important. If So here's the little difference that black is losing this endgame because, again, I show you this in the very beginning. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that he set up the opposition, he is already on the last rank and he's losing this. The opposition is too late. I show you this, he's missing the ninth rank to claim a draw. What is called the F7 square? You, you know, I really don't know. Not mine square? <laughs> the free square? I don't know how to really uh, uh, title it. The free square, I guess. So I'm gonna show you uh, show you um, a mutual mind square which none of the sides can use. So, for example, this is going to be a draw. Ah, just a second. I wanted to show you why this was a draw because if white was to move, there have been many, many uh, tragic comedies. So, let's say it is black to move. If black is to move, this is an easy draw. Yes, this is an easy draw, because black plays, let's say, here. So king f6 is going to be losing. You don't want to allow this, because the black king has already managed to outflank the opponent. So the right choice here, instead of the king f6, is king f4, here. And now if you know the basic stuff about the opposition, this is an easy draw. You just play here. King e5 and king e3. Again, simple opposition. Ah, there's many tragic comedies by Dvoretsky. Yeah, yeah, the Scottish first board, wasn't it? The women's, some, some women game. Yeah, that was quite unfortunate for them. Right. So the wrong move here would be to play king e3. Because king e3, king e5, now black forces the opposition. Okay, I think I already explained this like 20 times. I hope you finally understand it. If somebody didn't understand it, then I um, uh, hope you finally did. Show you again some funny examples. So, for example, tragic comedy. A tragic comedy. I mean, chess is full of tragic comedies. Actually, I've prepared some of the examples. I've made some of them myself. So here is going to be this position. King is going to be on f3, king on g6, rook on a4, and black just played rook f5. It might seem, I mean, what is to do here? 
This is an easy draw. So, this is exactly what White thought. I mean, he could just play with a king and this is an easy rook endgame, easy draw. There's nothing to talk about. I even mentioned this in one of my previous boot camps. But, White played rook f4 with a very simple idea. I want to force an opposition. So his idea was, after the trade, this is an easy draw as long as you position the king always in front of the pawn when you're stepping back. And this is gonna be easy draw. So what he missed was king g5. Yes. So again, it's all about the opposition. And that's it. He can resign. Because after rook takes on f5, king takes on f5, now king has to move. And again, he would love to say, I'm not gonna move. I'm gonna just sit here and do nothing. I mean, you have to move, buddy. Yeah, this is quite a, quite a famous example, so please don't miss that. I mean, that rook endgame was easily drawish, so this is something you definitely want to avoid. Right. Alright, so let me show you something about... Uh, this is going to be slightly tricky. So speaking about the opposition, actually this is an example I would love to show you. And I will show you. Because it was composed by a Latin composer, Hermanis Matissons. He was one of the most famous composers in the uh, early 20th century. Unfortunately, uh, he passed away quite at a young age. He was a brilliant composer. So he composed this endgame. He came from Latvia. I'm from Latvia myself. And this, again, is going to be all about opposition I'm oh, sorry no not the kings of course so what okay king on h5 and king on h5 okay and white is the move right so here black is the move no I'm sorry white is the move it might seem wait a second what big idea here I mean I have an extra pawn but if you would pay attention to what's happening here White is about to lose both pawns after king g4, king g4, king g5, and it's going to be all about the opposition. Only one move. So let's see, let's test the most immediate continuation. So let's say I'm gonna try king g2. The obvious move, I have no clue what's happening here. Ah, it's gonna be more tricky than that. I'm gonna play king g2, king g4. I think, wait a second, what is this? King f2, here, 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 and hooray, I forced an opposition! It's not an opposition, because black has one more extra move. You're gonna do that. So let's go back. You might say, wait a second, no, I'm gonna be tricky. I'm gonna play king h2 first. King h2, here, here, here. Here, here, opposition. Again, black has this extra move. You might think, wait a second. So where's the solution here? You might try, okay, 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 okay. I'll give up the pawns immediately. F5, with the idea to play G6. Here, 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 here. here. Opposition? Nope, not quite. Hey, McClum. How are you? So the right move, yes, yes, Lali, I, I see you know that. So the right move is g6. So king g6 is easy draw. Here, here, this is a draw. And it doesn't really matter if black is going to win the spawn or not. So let's say here, uh, let's imagine, I mean, somehow by miracle, he manages to win the spawn. I mean, you can take it. As long as I know how to build up the opposition, this pawn doesn't matter. So the correct move after g6, f takes, you might think, wait, okay, now I got it, now I got it. I'll play king g2. And after king g4, I'll play f5. Except after g takes, king f2, king f4, again you are in the opposition. Wait a second, what's happening here? 
So finally, when you'd spend quite a lot of time checking the position, you'd realize the only move which is saving the position first was g6, f takes, then f5. g5 is easy draw, so you have to take. And now this is gonna be extremely, extremely important. The next move is the only one which saves the game. Again, remember the opposition. King h2 is going to be king h4. King g2 is going to be king g4. So we play king g1. And after king g5, king f1. So this was the last fun. No, 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 no. King g2 would be again losing. King g2, king g4. Thank you. Thank you for the game. That's all position. King f2, king f4. We already know this. So the right last final move was king f1. We are waiting for black first to play king f4 or king g4. Let's say black is going to play king g4. Uh, we would happily play king f2 and king f4 again resign. <laughs> so we play king g2 here and here. Opposition. Opposition. And this, guys, I mean this, is the only way to draw this. So it's really, it's really important. Otherwise, I mean, you can easily lose this endgame without having the slightest clue what you did wrong. I mean, you supposedly made the normal looking moves. You play king g2, king f2, but the opposition is all about the pawn endgames. Right, so now you know it. So let me show you about the distant opposition. What is a distant opposition? So here we already had a slight glimpse. What is it? Oh, thank you. Ah, uh, Lolly, you already knew that before, right? <laughs> right, so this, the next example is going to be extremely, extremely important. Ah, uh, theory easy, application hard. Okay, I'm going to show you the next example. And about Let's say, this is also from the book. Again, it's all about the opposition. I'll tell you honestly. I'll tell you honestly. I mean, hey, Lolly, thank you. Thank you for your sub. Appreciate that. There you go, me dancing again. That's me in Bahamas, maybe, one day. <laughs> That's a dream. Yeah, I'm going to be dancing in Bahamas. I'm doing the bootcamps from there. So that's the that's the joke behind it. Uh, so so it's all about the opposition in this, this example, and um, it's going to be uh, just a second. I think it was black to move. Yeah, this is black to move. And I'll tell you honestly, which I started to mention is most of the occasions I don't know all of those. This is Dvoretsky. Dvoretsky is in game manual. In most of the occasions, I don't know exactly, I mean, what to play in each position. I recognize the patterns. I recognize position. Of course, I recognize the, um, I recognize the opposition because that's quite basic, at least for me. I'm a grandmaster. I recognize distant opposition. I recognize some theoretical stuff I've read in the book. And when it comes to the actual game, I apply this knowledge. So every single occasion is different. And uh, you would ask, have I made terrible mistakes in endgames? Sure, I have made terrible mistakes. I'm gonna show you. I, I've made even terrible mistakes as Grandmaster. Yeah, I mean, most of those times, those were actual time control games, but I've, I've made them. So it doesn't mean that I know this theoretical stuff that I'm always going to be 100% correct. Yes, calculation is all about it. But still, we have to recognize already positions from afar because if, if I know that this position is winning a drawish, I know I can go there. I don't have to, like, throw a coin. And what, what is it going to be, right? So I know this position is winning. This position is drawish. I just go there. Right. Okay. So this position. So this position here, it's again all about the opposition and black, black's the move. So you have a choice to play either king c7 or king a7 so let's assume you're you're having this position 
in the game. I have to choose. So maybe let let me maybe flip it over. I have to choose. So so what is it? King c7, king a7. How do you know? Yeah, it's black to move. How do you know, man? How do you make the correct move? Yes, of course, it makes calculation a lot easier. Zeller, yes, Florian, yes. So it's either king c7 or king a7. If we have this position, we already recognize it's going to be all about the opposition. So of course we cannot play king a7. Why not? Hey, Magician of Riga? Okay. Love the nickname. <laughs> of course, Magician of Riga bears the title from Michael Tal. Okay. So, King A7 is a big mistake because A5. B takes, King A5. And this is opposition. We know this. I mean, this is basic stuff. Hello, Chakir. And after King B7, King B5, King C7, King C5. There is going to be outflanking. This is why this is so important to know. So the correct move, the correct move is only King C7. C5. Congratulations, you have made your opposition. But the thing is, this is an A pawn. It doesn't matter. You just position the king in the corner and it's going to stay there. No outflanking is going to work. So why can I do this? a5 just trade it just trade it and this is an easy pawn end game easily drawish c5 king c6 king c4 king c7 always in front of the pawn instead of this white can try to outflank you and play king a6 king c6 king a7 let's not allow us to be outflanked King c7, king a8, and the final accurate move is king c8. King c so why this was important? Because king c6 would lose to king b8, king b7, and the problem is we cannot magically teleport. Ah, uh, this is the side of his opposition, this is what Anaxia mentioned about, right? Yeah, we just cannot make it to the corner. Yeah, the sideways opposition is tricky. Let me show you one more tricky example. You're gonna love it. And it really requires to know this stuff. And this is gonna be really, really interesting. Okay, so the pawn is going to be... Uh, just a second, maybe from White's perspective. Here, 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 here. And here, I think it's this, and what is the move? So, <laughs> now we think, now we think, what, what was it all about that opposition and distant opposition and outflanking? So what do you think, what really works here? The position is extremely simple, there's what? There's five pieces on the board, two kings, three pawns. Go for the distant opposition, right? So king f1 loses? Why is that? <laughs> yeah, people already are guessing the correct move. So king f1, I'm gonna show you why it loses. Here. Here. Um... King G3. Now the only move which is winning is King E3, King E2, and there you go, outflanking. We push the king out. And again, White would love to say, I'm gonna sit here and wait. <laughs> Nobody have to move. You have to make a move. You just cannot sit and do nothing. So after King G4, King F2, that's it. You win the pawn, and one with pawn promotes. So you might think, wait a second, I could try something else. After king d3, I could play king g2. And after king e3, king g3, that's a draw. Black can also be smart. He can play king e2. And immediately, king g3, king f1 is the outflanking. So the right move, who was it already posted in the chat, is... 
we are going to keep the so-called distant opposition. So this is the very first example of the distant opposition. It's paradoxical. I mean, that sometimes these crazy paradoxical ideas work because you recognize the pattern. As soon as the black king is going to play king e2, I'll play king g2. As soon as the black king is going to play king e1, I'll play king g1. Let me show you. Let me show you. So let's say here. Only move drawing here. I'll play here. Only move. Only move, which is drawing this position. Here. It's paradoxical. I mean, you're just going away. You're going away from this. If you touch the pawn... Ah, uh, don't touch the pawn. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately... Unfortunately, this is all about... The touch roll is still there. You touch the pawn, you touch the piece, you have to move it. If this is what you're referring to. And king e3, king g3, king e2, king e2. King d1, king h2, king d1, king h1, and theoretically, black can try to be extremely, extremely tricky and even go further. King c1. Just remember, don't allow this outflanking or direct opposition. So I'll just play king g1. This is the only move, by the way. Why is this only move? Because this is going to be... Do you recognize what this is? A distant opposition. You are the one who is now being distant opposition. Yep. King d2. And no matter what you're doing, the black king is coming closer. So king... King... E, king e3. King g3, king e3. That's it. Tricked. Yeah, just remember it. I mean, it's not, not always the exactly direct opposition. So after king c1, the only move is king g1. King c2, the only move is king g2. You are ready to play king d2 to king f2. King d1, king h1 again. This is totally swindling. I'll tell you honestly, I'll tell you honestly, this would be easy mistake also for a grandmaster playing in blitz. I mean, for a grandmaster playing a classical game, sure, he would find, I'm pretty sure most of the grandmasters are pretty much skilled in end games. In blitz, easy, easy to make a mistake because those are not the natural moves. You don't have the time to think about it. But since imagining that you're gonna have the time, you should be able to find this. And after king d3, the only move only move king h3 again distant opposition so this is extremely extremely important and uh yep yep king h3 and i'm gonna show you this example i played it myself so that's one of my games at the grandmaster level but this was a blitz game yeah, after king d1, king h1, exactly power slide. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Appreciate that. So this is going to be my own game. I played it myself. I th that was a blitz game. I played it online, so I made a mistake. Um, Just a second, I'll find it. Oh, I didn't... Okay. Just a second, just a second, just a second. Here we go. So this was my game against... Uh, let's fast forward to the end game. Doesn't really matter, matter what happened there. So we got to this position. So we had this position. This is my game. I was playing against Igor Kovalenko, one of the leading Latvian grandmasters. This is a blitz game. We played it online. So again, it's all about the opposition. And you recognize the position. I'm playing this position. I know Queen E5 is a draw. I know this. So I play Queen E5 check. Has to take because King of Fate is gonna be thank you. So Queen E5 here. Now F6 is gonna be easy draw. F6 takes King F7, just whatever. Just position the king on G4. This is basic stuff. We already know this. Instead, he played King of Fate. Now, where do you move? Where do you move? So why does the move here? I had literally seconds here. 
and I made this very big mistake. I played automatically. <laughs> That's it. I had no time to think about the distant oppositions, about the oppositions, about the outflank. You just automatically played. That's it. I was lost. Yeah, I played King D6. Actually, King F6, I think it's also losing. King F6. Yeah, King E8. Here. Here. And... So it's gonna be after King E4, King E6. The king is going to push out. And we are gonna lose this pawn as well. So after King, F king E5, King E7, King F4... The only move is King D6. This is the so-called distant outflanking. <laughs> Mr. Five Kong. Yeah. And again, King E4, King E6, King E4, King D5. Here, 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 here. This pawn is lost. Yes, I got them. Thank you. All right. So I play King D6 in the game. And after King E8, I had the idea that after I can still play King D5. I just did not have the time to think about the distant opposition. So he played King D7, King E7, and after let's say King D4, F6 already wins. By the way, F6, King F6, and King G5 is the outflanking. The previous position? What if the black plays g4? Oh, you refer to that position, but what is gonna make to the queens? I can already respond to that hopped noob test. F takes e4, g5, white also promotes. White also promotes to the queen. Black promotes and white promotes. That's a lovely idea I forgot to mention about. So white just takes on g4 with the f pawn just with the f, f takes on g4 just pushes forward black promotes first but what is the second after that so the right solution here it's so tempting to play king f6 it's so tempting to play king d6 and both of these moves are losing so we just know the basic principle of the opposition so we play doesn't matter king e4 king d4 a uh, king d4 actually i'm not so sure now, king d4 also is a draw, but king e4, king e4 is the easiest. King e4. Distant opposition. Let's be careful. We have to meet king d7 with king d5. We have to meet king e7 with king e5. So, let's say we are going to play here. Here. Oh, just a second. I think I already made a mistake. King e8. Oh, it's not so simple, really. Oh, I think I just tricked myself. So king e4 actually is a mistake. <laughs> so tricky stuff. So king d4. King d4. I apologize about that. Yeah, so it's all about the distant opposition. King e8 and king e4. So this is the so-called distant opposition. I hope you see it now. It's just, I don't know what was in my head. Yes, yes, king e4 loses. Insane. And king e4, I'm not so sure, actually. Here, king e4... Now uh, that's still a draw after King E8 as long as you are playing King E4. Distant opposition. King D8, King D4. King E7, King E5. King D7, King D5. King D8. King D8. Now this is the tricky position. Yes, the point is to be in the opposition, or also this time, in the distant opposition. I cannot play king d6, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose. <laughs> is this obvious? It's not obvious. T tell me somebody who is not gonna play king d6 here, because this is the most natural move here. King d6 loses, because of king e8. King d7, or king e5, king e7 here and this unfortunately is a losing move just because black can transform this in the outflanking maneuver this is an extremely extremely nice example uh, so the right solution here was to keep the distant opposition after king f8 play king f4 
after king e8 play king e4 king d8 king d4 king c7 king c5 king d7 king d5 king e8 king e4 this is something what you'd have to practice i mean without the knowledge just come in the game do it like that you're not convinced about that okay just very quickly i'll show you the previous position i hope you got this one so the distant opposition at its finest i lost this game but again like i mentioned yeah this is exactly the same how firuja lost against carlson exactly so so it was all about the opposition i don't know what was in his head he absolutely knew that end game so just some totally brain lock i don't know what happened to him right so the previous example again let me show you very quickly so it was this one right so why was the move yeah i think you refer to this only exception this only exception here you mean g4 this is what you mean right and now f takes would be a mistake because black just promotes forward to the queen but here is one move one accurate move which makes a draw which is king g2 you don't take it yet because black cannot take on f3 yet because you lose the e5 pawn and after king e2 now you take it after king d2 you can already take it that's it That's it. So this was, yeah, I apologize, I should have showed that. Forgot. So this G4 was a last trick that was in um, a Black's arsenal and he could have used it. Hello, Zabal Yenets. Thank you. Hope you had also a great uh, new year. On the horse being overrated. You mean the knight? Yeah, I know Petr Svidel likes to title this as the horse. Actually, I think it's the bishop which is overrated. I was a big fan of the bishop of many years. I can't realize it's not really so simple. All right. Let me show you more. Let me show you more. So this is going to be quite tricky. I'm going to show you just for the sake of complexity. We are not, not going to talk too much about it. This is yet another example of a distant opposition. Just a second. Just a second. It's going to be quite complex, but still, if you understand the, the principle of the distant opposition, maybe it's not really so difficult. So the king is going to be on a5, the king is going to be on e5, and what is the move? Now, what do we do here? Let's imagine you are having this position in the game. You have no clue. So I think, what's the big idea here? So I'm gonna play King D6. Oh, Kimkia. <laughs> Very quickly already. The correct answer. So King D6 is a draw. King D6, King B6, King D7, King B7. Okay, let's be smart. Let's be smart. Let's try the distant opposition. I'm going to play King E6. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be smart about it. Yes, we are going to win. So king e6, black also is smart. He's also not born yesterday. King e7, king a7, king e8, king a8, king e7, king b7. Does work. Does work. So here the correct idea is paradoxical. We are going to the opposite direction. But going to the opposite direction, the idea is to force the opposite uh, the distant opposition to the black king so that's all it's all about so king f5 king b6 if king a6 that's even worse king a6 i think we can already force the distant opposition immediately actually you know i think black would be drawing this if he had access to one more line to the left if not king a6 but further 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 that would be super super distant opposition but it's not available it's not there no 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 this is win this is win so 
So let me show you king b6, king f6, distant opposition. You see, distant opposition. King b7, king f7. King b6, outflanking. King b, king c7, here, here. Yeah, and this, this easily wins. So it's really, really tricky. So I'm not, not going to dwell too much about this uh, particular example. So I just wanted to show you this idea of the distant opposition. So it's quite tricky stuff. I'll tell you honestly, in my own games, how many times have I had it? I mean, I'm a chess professional. I've played chess for already a prof professional level for more than 10 years. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, I mean, quite a few times, quite a few times, but it's extremely important still to know this because you don't really know at uh, which moment you're gonna need to show the skill. So, unfortunately, I mean, I could easily go the next day, I could play in a big tournament and maybe the decisive game to save the game or score the most important victory, it's going to be all about the distant opposition. Then you're gonna think, oh my goodness, I mean, why didn't I study this? Why didn't I study this? The order of the study of this Sackman? Yes, Sackman! You have excellent memory. You're right. Sackman, 1913. Very good memory. <laughs> Here, black. Does not need to touch. I mean, you can touch the pawns. Nobody's gonna force you to move them. <laughs> yeah, you can try to do that. I mean, if you cannot move, then the touch rule is dissolved automatically. So that's the rule. All right. One more tragic comedy. I mean, I love to show tragic comedies. I was one of the victims myself of such one. Yeah, that was a blitz game, like I already explained a couple of times. So this is going to be quite a funny one. Um, just a second, just a second. Pawns are going to be here. On b4, king on b1, and queen d2, and the king is on d5. Okay. This is winning position for black. This was a game between David Yates and Savely Tartakover in 1927. A long, long time ago. More than about one hundred years. Tartakover, yes. Do you know this game? So Tartakov is playing this position with black. And he made the absolute human mistake. I so feel him. I understand it. This is possible to make this. So he was trying to... <laughs> you can say that. He was trying to... Mis uh, to this is the so-called... Simplify. Simplifying the position is one of the fine things that every good player is trying to master. And obviously, Saveli Tartakover, he was one of the leading players in the first uh, half of 20th century. Not maybe first half, but the beginning, beginning of 20th century. And uh, he thought, wait a second, I can simplify this position into a winning pawn endgame. I mean, he doesn't have to, but it's easier. So he played... We take some b4. Seemingly a genius move. So I might think, wait a second. Why did he give up the queen? So the idea is real. A takes. King b2. King c4. King a3. You think, wait a second. What did Tartakover blunder here? Because king c3, that's a stalemate. No. His idea was to play b2. And this is all about the opposition. So he thought, wait a second, this is already easily winning position because after king takes on b2, king b4, I force the opposition. Now you can imagine the nightmare, the horror when his opponent exactly played king a2. Yeah, that is unbelievable. It seems the same, but again, the principle is the opposition. And that's it. And that's it. So king c3, king b1, king b3 is a stalemate. And king b4, king b2, that's an opposition. But from the different side. 
Yeah, that's amazing. So this position was winning. And I'll tell you that. I mean, the chess world is full of such tragedies. Tragic comedies, so to speak. So he misplayed this. I made such mistakes myself. Not really that painful. But some very similar ones. So that's absolutely normal. And Right. Alrighty. Um, I think I wanted to show you... Oh, this is quite a nice one. Yeah, before, before I'm gonna move on to the next example. <laughs> they have school, online schooling. Right, before I'm gonna move on to the next example, I would like to mention a little about the sponsor of the stream. I hope you have two minutes of that. Uh, since the middle of December, I've been sponsored by uh, one of the fastest growing VPNs in the market. It's called Surfshark. Surfshark, yes, yes, yes. They're my sponsor of my channel. I would love to mention them. Thank you, GM500. Uh, so just a second. Very, very briefly. I'm not gonna um, divert you too much. So Surfshark is one of the leading VPNs in the market. V leading VPN, that's uh, a virtual private network, which allows you to create uh, anonymous uh, network and hide your data from the ISP. And why it's so important? Why so important? One of the biggest uh, features for a VPN and uh, on this occasion for Surfshark is those targeted ads. Every single day when I'm trying to buy something in an online store and I go to the Facebook, every corner I'm seeing a targeted ad. So I was looking for these LED lights to, fight, uh, to buy for my uh, streaming equipment. And when I ventured to the Facebook, Facebook is trying to sell me LED lights. So that's my ISP, my internet provider. It's selling my data to the advertisers. It's so annoying, I can tell you that. And having a VPN installed allows you to bypass this problem because your ISP is not gonna know what you're doing. So that's really so great. And the second one of the biggest feature is the access to the entire US Netflix library. Yeah, I've been using it ever since. Uh, here in Latvia, we have something like 10% of US library of Netflix. So annoying, you can believe that. I pay exactly the same stuff that Americans are paying, and I get 10%. So I install VPN, I can get access to entire 100%. How great is that? Right? So one of the best features. So don't worry about that. That's legal. That's okay. As long, as long as VPNs are legal in your country. Yeah, there's some very, very few short list of countries where VPNs are illegal. I think that's China, Russia, United Arab Emirates, a couple of them. Yeah, very, very few. Very, very few. Yeah, and uh, no, it's legal. It's legal. Completely legal. You can check it. If you don't believe me, check it online. That is absolutely legal. And um, it's really, really great stuff, at least accessing these geo-locked uh, content. Yeah, that's quite quite important and um, North Korea <laughs> I don't know about that I don't know about North Korea but um, I would advise for everyone everyone who wishes to purchase a VPN just check if VPN is legal in your country in most of the free world it is I'm from Latvia and Latvia VPN is totally fine yes yes that it is I mean two dollars and 21 cents for one month yeah, just compare the prices, for example, I mean, the big the big guns, NordVPN and Express VPN, they're the big guns, I don't argue. But Surfshark is one of the fastest growing ones, so they're so cheap comparing to the big ones. And also there's this bonus that you, if you're using my promo code, which gm 5 Congo already posted, just a second, I can post it again, VPN, it comes with 83% discount. If you take a two-year plan, 83% discount and three months extra. If that's not a great price, I don't know what it is. I have myself VPN installed on my laptop from which I'm streaming right now. I have it installed on my smart TV. It was great. Okay, okay, check it out. They're great. I love them. <laughs> my, very first, my very first sponsors of my, of my channel. Super, super grateful for them. All right. Let me switch back. So, uh, there you, there you see Surfshark. 
the logo is on my screen. So let's go back to the end games. Let's go back to the end game. Some fascinating stuff which I would like to show you. Yeah, this one is gonna be quite tricky. The green screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, the green screen is quite cool. Um, only I have some troubles about the lighting. I'm pretty sure you don't see that. The small fine details. Yeah, the best lights, they're coming. They're coming. I've ordered them. They're coming. I'm right now using an IKEA lamp. Several of them, actually. <laughs> so at least I hope I look good. So. Anyway, so it's all about the content, right? Not the looks. Right, so the next example I'm going to show you is a quite tricky example of the so-called mind squares. Let me show it to you. I try to make it more and more difficult with every single example. So where is it? The pawn here, 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 and here. So this is the position. Hello, perpetual stalemate. How are you? How are you? <laughs> You're just for the looks. Well, I hope I look great. Hope that. <laughs> right. I, I look good, right? Okay, so this position. Why does the play? And the technique is extremely, extremely important. So this is going to be all about the mind squares, which I mentioned about previously. Yeah, sure. I mean, king b4, easy move, right? Okay, king b4, king b7. But what do you do now? What do you now? What do you do now? So what do you think? A4. A4 is a mistake. So again, a4, king a6, let's say a5, king b7. How do you progress? King c4, king a6, king d4 here. Remember, guys, I think I told you something about the mind squares. So this is the mind square for white. This is the mind square for black. And black plays first king b4. We cannot do this. I mean, this is still a draw. We are not losing this. Okay, okay. King a5 looks good. I, I don't argue. Okay, we can check it. King a5, king a7. Ah, it's not so simple. It's not so simple, really. a4, king b7. I mean, king b7, king a7, king b7, king a7. The black king just can just wander there for infinite time. Yes, yes, and king b4, king a6. Still a draw. This is still a draw. Here, 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 here. White is just not in time. King b4. Forcing white to play king d6, king b5, and that's a losing position. But I mean, white is still drawing this after king d4 with an easy opposition. Okay, we failed, but it, at least we we did not uh, we did not uh, lose it. Right. So the right solution here, king b4 is correct move. So this is going to be all about the mind squares. So the right move is first we play king c3. I think so at least. <laughs> Just a second, let me check. No, king b7, king b3. Uh, just a second, I think this position, king a4, king b7, ah, okay, I should have, should have showed this from this moment, okay, king b3, now, we are gonna very, very carefully forward to the d6 square, so our target is to get the king, so the d6 square. So this is how we are going to do it. King b4. Here. King c3. King a6. Now. Now this is extremely, extremely important. How do we play here? Tread carefully. Remember the mind squares. So now, which is the mind square? For which side? For white. The mind square is d4. 
If we play King D4, Black is just going to play King B4. Hello, roller coaster, how are you? How is your day? Mined, mind square. Not mind square, mind square. King D4 is drawing. Exactly, this is a draw. Seem Wait a second, I have A4, but you are still not in time. Still not in time. And you have to go back and again make a draw. I mean, okay, you failed, at least you're not losing this position. So the correct move, King C4 gives nothing. King C4, King A5 achieves nothing. Hey, Scott, thank you for your sub. That's me dancing in Bahamas one day. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah, so the correct move is King D3. Again, we will remember the basic principle of the mind square. If black is going to play King B5, we are going to play King B4, and that's it. We are going to win this. So after King D3, black can play King A5. Now what do we do here? Again, remember, mind squares, we don't want to step on them. We want to avoid them. I mean, who wants to step on a mine? <laughs> Not me, definitely. Yes. King e4. And now after king b5, because king e5, king d6 already was a big problem, it is black who steps on a mine. <laughs> yeah, perpetual stalemate. I would, I would trade. You know, actually, this is what I did. No, I mean, not to Bahamas. I mean, something like five years ago, I went to Australia for a good four weeks. That was, that was awesome. I mean, Latvia was something like minus uh, 20 degrees. I went to Australia. It was plus what? Plus 30? Plus 40? <laughs> right. So here, after King B5, King D4, Black has stepped on the mine square. And he loses. That's it. Here, doesn't matter. Here, here, here. I mean, maybe instead of this, after King E5, you can be accurate and go around. Just go around. If you want to be really accurate, you, if you want to preserve your pawn, you can also do it like this. The concept of the mind square. Yes. That, that is that is extremely extremely important I mean maybe I could show you a couple of more examples so that you better understand I'll show you the next example and I'll allow you to answer which are the mind squares I know Hrant he lives in uh, what was the city I know he lives in Australia right with his girlfriend Canberra was it I think, I think so, because I did a commentary for Australian Blitz Tournament, Victorian Down Under, um, in December. So that was, that was, that that's when I learned that he's living in Australia. I know Krant also myself, so. Any advice how to become super good in tactics? Practice makes perfect. What can I tell you? Just practice. Practice, buddy. I've practiced myself for many, many years. It didn't happen overnight. All right. So the next position is going to be this one. So now you'll finally learn about the so-called untouchable pawns. So this is again going to be woodpecker method. Yeah, woodpecker method is great. So this is going to be again about the principles of the mind squares. Now, can you tell me or somebody who understands the concept of the mind squares? Which are these for white and for black? <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> C4 and B6. Yes, C4 and B6. Exactly, exactly. So you cannot really go king b6 because king c4, white is forcing black into a tsukzwang. He has uh, no move, he has to give up the pawn. 
if white is to move here king c4, he steps on the mine, black plays king b6, and white has to move, he loses a pawn. I'll tell you this, in many occasions it's really much more complicated than that. Because there are other factors. Maybe there is a pawn on the king side. Maybe there is something more important, very close, that you are sometimes willingly stepping on a mind square. But here, here, you cannot. So none of the sides can make a progress. I'm gonna play king c3, king b7, king b3, king c7, king c3, king b7. So both sides realize that this is a mind square. I cannot step on it. F4 and H5. Uh, not here. No, uh, Zelmer Florian, not here. I cannot imagine how F4 and H5 is a mind square. Maybe a, just a different. Yeah, this is a draw. This is a draw. Maybe I could show you a different example. Just a second, so that you again better understand of the principle of the mind squares. Let me think of something interesting. Ah, there was actually quite a funny one. A uh, game by Alexandra Lechin. I could... Uh, I could find it for you. Just a second. It was here. It was here. Very, very short. I'll find it. Ah, I think I'll try to remember. I'll do it from the memory. I'll do it from the memory because I think I remember the idea. If I don't, then I apologize. Uh, just a second. I'll do it from the memory. I think it was something like this. Just a second. Um, here, here. I think it was this. I think it, I think so. I think so. So this was, um, yeah, this is the position. or very close to it. So this was a game by Alexandra Lekin. He was playing against somebody. I don't remember against who. This is the book. This is in the book. I just cannot find it. On the spot, I, I just remember it. So the idea again is all about the mind squares. And uh, so again, let's identify the mind squares. Any ideas? So where the kings cannot go? Here, actually, king b4 might be possible. I just didn't check it. So maybe it's slightly, slightly more different than that. Blindfold chess. Yeah, I guess it does, and it improves your calculation, at least, imagination. Thank you, Zelmer. I mean, I remember many positions. I Most of the time, I, I don't need a book. I've read it a couple of times already, so... i just using for reference. Yeah, d4 and e6, that's very good. That's very good. Yes. So, the idea is, I cannot play king d4 because of king e6. So, king d3 is correct. King e7 is correct. Again, king d4, king e6, we cannot do that. And now the correct move is by the use of the mind squares. We play e4. Obviously, f takes simply wins. f takes king e4 simply wins. f4. King e2. King e6. And now, and now, what do you do? You have to see this from afar, to be honest. <laughs> yes. King of two. So it's all about the mind squares. So now the mind square is different. The mind squares have changed. They are not the same than they were before. Now the mind squares are e5 and f3. Because if you remove this pawn, if you remove this pawn off the board, 
king e5, king f3, king f3, king e5. So those are the mind squares, e5 and f3 squares. But the thing here is that black cannot wait because the pawn on e5 is removing the d6 and f6 square. So he has to take, otherwise here after king f2, he has to go here, here and here. And after king f3, king e4, we just collect a pawn. Um, not king d3, no. Because king d3, king e5, that's a very bad move. Now it is white who stepped on the mind square. See, yes, also d3. So I think I think I'll correct myself. Also, d3 square is a mind square. I was more thinking about f3 and e5, but d3 also is a bad move. Yeah, that's also a bad square. So this is exactly what Alekin did, the fourth world champion, one of the greatest players in the history. So this is what he played. He played king d3, king e7, he played e4, f4, king e2, king e6, and king f2. It might seem easy win. Maybe, yes. For for maybe for a Lekin it was easy. He just recognized the pattern. Uh, was e4 possible immediately? Oh, just a second. Oh, yes, it was possible. I think I'm I miss miss um, mispositioned. So that position was slightly different, I apologize about that. I was uh, setting up the position from memory. Maybe the king was on c2, not on c3. Yeah, I think it was on c2. It was on c2, not on c3. I apologize about that. I mean, otherwise e4 just wins on the spot. e4, f4... Oh, just a sec. How does it win again? Oh, maybe it was exactly like that. e4, f4... Ah, this is exactly the same, yeah. Pardon, pardon my blabbering. I just slightly confused. All right, um, let me show you more, more stuff. Maybe a couple of games from my, from my experience, which I've played myself. Some pawn and games. I checked them prior to stream. King e2 here. Um, no, king e2 is the only move actually. I show you this briefly. Yeah, this is this is where White is winning. Let me show you a couple of games from my experience. Just a second. Fu some funny ones. Some funny ones. <laughs> so, like I mentioned, I mean, chess is all about tragic comedies. Uh, this was my game. Okay. Have a good dinner, Zelmer. This is my game against um, one of the strongest Italian grandmaster Sabino Brunello great guy uh, we played it what was it 2000 and I don't remember some European blitz championships I mean who remembers already one of the years because I played there so many times and uh, I was playing with white so I had this position and I think wait a second this is easily winning so but this is a blitz game we are having 3 minutes plus 2 seconds and we are already blitzing out at this moment and I think this should be easy win and instead of the rook end games I'm thinking how can I convert this convert to winning pawn end game because the pawn end games are the simplest end games simplest end games so I play rook c5 first or c7 doesn't really matter here, c7, here, king c2, here. I think, wait a second, what's what's the problem here? I mean, just, just rook c4, he took on c7, I took on c7, king takes on c7. And now the thing is, after king d3, uh, just a second, pretty sure I... Just a second, king d3... King d... just a second, let me double check it if I'm not missing anything. Uh, this is quite funnily... A draw. Can you believe this? This is a draw. And the correct move here was king d7. 
Remember what I mentioned to you about the distant opposition? Hey, Passpawn! Thank you for your sub again! Haha, <laughs> I also thought so. Hey, how are you doing? I also thought so this is winning. So King C4, King C6, wait a second, where's the problem? Here? Wait, what am I missing here? So let's play King A4. Here? 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 Yeah, we're about the queen, right? The only minor little problem here is... How do you stop the pawn? <laughs> hey, thank you! Yeah, I've had it since the start of January. There's no way to stop it! No checks! Those annoying pawns! Pin it! Sure, here I'll just play King H1. I'll tell you honestly, how could I have foreseen this? I'm playing a Blitzkrieg and I had no clue that something like this could be a droid's possession. So again, let's go back. Let's go back. <laughs> this is insane, insane endgame. So I just go, I went here, I deliberately gave up the pawn because I thought this is going to be easy draw. I mean, easily winning. So I played here, 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 expecting to shake hands already because normally good opponents resign when this is winning. So he made a mistake actually, but after King d7, distant opposition, this is insane move. Let's say King d4, King d6, King c4, King c6. I win the pawn, but I'm gonna lose this one. Here, here, I could try King c3. This is what I did in the game. This is what I did, this is what I did, here, here. Here, here. You can imagine the total face palm I had during the game. But this is okay. I mean, to blunder something like this in a blitz game, this happens. This is absolutely a tragic comedy. So what happened in the game is slightly different. Is he misplayed it first? He what he did? He played first. King d6. So this is what I did. King d6 is the most logical move you have to wants the king, right? I tried, it doesn't work. I tried that. I'm gonna show you maybe how the game finished. So king d4. Now he is in the opposition. He cannot stop me. And here the funny thing is. After King C6, I was lazy to calculate. Yeah, this was a blitz game. I was lazy to calculate to go King E5, take here, just push the pawn forward. This is easily winning. Yeah, so King E5. Um, here, 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 here. There's no tricks, no nothing. Why is just faster? Why is just faster? I thought, I mean, this is exactly the same. So what I did, I went to the other side. So after king d4, king c6, here, 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 here. And this is when I came to realize that this, is posi this position is drawish. So here, here, here. And the game finished something like... I tried to make it work. I think I gave a check. But unfortunately, my opponent takes the H pawn. And we both promoted to the queens. But. This is a draw. So it's quite amazing that this pawn endgame was drawish. I had never seen it before, actually. I could still actually try to set up a distant opposition. So let's try to check it. How does it work? Let's try to do this. So, by two squares, that's a distant opposition. Hey, Pong Grubber! Thank you for your raid. You hope you had a great stream yourself. We are um, doing a bootcamp about the pawn endgames. Hope you're gonna appreciate them in the middle of the stream. Doing some quality stuff. Just sit around and enjoy it. <laughs> 
All right, so again, the distant opposition. So I immediately king d3, king d7. We already discovered this is a distant opposition by weird uh, accident. This is drawish. Incredible. <laughs> right, so I could try to play king d6, uh, king d2. And again, after king d2, what do you think is the correct move? Ah, king d2, I think it's even king d6, yeah. Yeah, this is easy. I was uh, I was trying to set up a very far distant opposition, but that's not even necessary. That's not even necessary. So the funny thing is, which I already showed to everybody else and those newcomers who didn't see that, that after king d3, king d7, this is a draw. <laughs> this is an insane draw. Distant opposition. And somehow this doesn't win. Incredible. All right. So that was yet another tragic comedy I had. Uh, probably would be a great addition to Dvoretsky's ending manual. It's full of them. I mean, great players have made tragic comedies. I showed you an example how Tartakover made a mistake, and I showed you already two mistakes, how, which I did myself, and probably every player can relate to that, having made incredible mistakes like this very recent example by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it. but this is this is an exception. I mean, Point Grubber, would you tell me honestly, when you have this position, would you even think about some nuances here? This is just easily winning, right? If you just play King C4, King B4, win the pawn, and I was playing this as a blitz game, so how I'm supposed to know that this is some kind of a weird exception where I have to be accurate? I just did not. I mean, apparently I just figured out a new drawing position. That was weird. Okay. So let me show you more. More uh, examples from my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Um. Okay, I'm going to show you this one. It's not going to be really so tricky as the others. I'm just going to explain some basic concepts. Uh, this was my game. Yeah, I played tragic comedies. What can I tell you? I also have played tra some tragic comedies. So this is my game against uh, American player. I uh, think he was an international master, uh, Justin Sarker, in 2016-17 uh, Wilton Cup. Quite an amazing event, which recently finished online. Not sure if you followed it. They had a really great edition of the Winners' Cup. Yeah, they were playing online uh, by a knockout tournament. All of the winners of previous tournaments, they were competing in a knockout tournament. Pieces style. Wood and... Wood and... Do you like it? And walnut. Wood and walnut. That's it. You can also set it up. I like it myself very much. So this was the game. I was trying to play for the win with black. So the pawn on f4 is about to be lost. So I decided to try rook e4. Takes takes, rook d4. These pawns don't have any support. And I decided the last chance for me is try to play a pawn in the game. So I played b5 with an idea to activate the rook and after rook e4 I was hoping that my opponent is not going to take with the rook because after b takes on c4 I can still try to push this let's say rook a6 rook takes an a4 rook a3 a5 a4 rook a1 I mean this is obviously still a draw but I mean I was looking for the win very badly because this is an open tournament I need to win I'm supposedly a a favorite on the paper and I went to the pawn endgame so what he did he took with the rook he's not afraid takes king h5 uh, here the trick is actually yeah g5 is also a draw I'm not gonna mention that king h5 here g5 here here king e4 so here it's all about 
the placement of the pawns on the position. So the mine squares. I don't think here is really any mine squares. So the black king can play king g3. And the white king cannot really play king d5, king d6 without losing the pawn on g2. So I would actually say the mind squares might be the pawns, actually g2 and d6. Because if the white king goes king e5, king d6, this allows the black king to play king g3, king takes on g2. So none of the sides can make any progress. So at this moment, what is really important, yeah, this is what happened in the game this is what happened so the, what really plays a big role here is the advancement and the position of the pawns at the queen side so my opponent played a4 so you might think wait a second where's the difference i mean i just play king g4 king g5 king g4 king g5 by not paying attention to what's happening with the queen side well let's check that let's check the theory Ah, now, now it comes... Ah, now it's... Yeah, that's just bad. Sorry, not king g5, but king g3. King g3, a5. I cannot take, because I'm going to lose these pawns very quickly. So let's say after a5, I'm waiting and doing nothing. a6. And now king f5. This is a winning endgame. So it's all about the placement of the pawns at the queen side, and the correct move after a4 is I play immediately a5. a5, and the king cannot make it here. So a6, I think it's already losing actually. a6, a5, king g3, king f5. The so called outflanking. Yes, that's a waiting move a5, exactly. And now I'm losing because takes, takes here. Here, the king gets to d5 d6, c5, and that's just losing. So I cannot allow for the white king to get control of the, um, of the f5 square, and I have to wait. So let's imagine in this position, we would have the white a pawn on a2. Not on a3, on a2. So if white would play a3 here, what would we do? Exactly, a6. To meet a4 with a5, because we need to get under control the f5 square. And as soon, and as soon as the pawns meet, king d5, king g3, and king d6, king g2 is also a draw. Both sides promote at the same time. And this is what happened in the game. None of the sides can actually progress. King d5, king g3, king g4. I cannot take. Because this king is going to be extremely annoying. So this is how the game finished. That's a draw. So don't be afraid of pawn endgames. Play them. Just, just study them slightly. I mean, I believe most of the pawn endgames are quite simple. You just have to count to 10, really. And they're much, much easier than rook endgames. I mean, rook endgames definitely, definitely are much, much uh, trickier. Okay, show you more. Show you more examples. Uh, for example, having a pawn endgame um, is a great way how you can simplify the position. So, for example, let's show you this position. Again, this is my game. And... Um, yeah, Rukenga is like going to 50. Uh, there's a lot more nuances you have to know. So let's imagine this position. There you can study. You can study here. I'm doing a bootcamp right now. <laughs> there's no better place. You can ask me the questions about the pawn enemies right away. So here we have this position. This is my game. I was playing it against um, a good player from Lithuania. Lukas Tauskas who was playing almost uh, international master level. Pretty good player. I think he is FM. And um, it's not a pawn endgame, but it's going to be all about the pawn endgame. Because like I mentioned, the pawn endgames are the easiest ones. 
<laughs> F4. Just a second, just a second. So if you would study the Endgame book by, for example, by Mark Dvoretsky or any other great book, you would realize that one of the most important principles is the stronger side, according to Dvoretsky, always is trying to trade pieces. The weaker side, I mean, the one who is having less material, is having to trade pawns. Uh, the bootcamp is once a week, usually. Usually once a week. Typically on Fridays, but I'm thinking maybe I'll, I'll move it on Sundays. I'll check it out. But typically it's on Friday evenings. Friday evenings, European time, uh, Pacific time for Americans, that's something like uh, 10 hours uh, before. So here about the four. Why F4 is wrong? Why it's wrong for the very basic principle is we recognize this idea from the Dvoretsky Zenigan manual is that the stronger side is trying to trade pieces, the weaker side is trying to exchange pawns. Why is that? Because I want to trade all of those pawns so that I can sacrifice my bishop for your last remaining pawn. So that's so simple. Yeah, effort is wrong. And maybe it's still somehow winning, but it's just wrong by the principle. So takes, 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 takes. Of course, black is not going to take on a four. Of course. Even if this is somehow winning, the principle is wrong. So the correct approach, the correct approach is we try to simplify the position into a winning pawn endgame. How do we do that? B4. Yes, B4 knight C5. And we need to do some basic calculation up to 10. Not really more. It's gonna be so much more simpler than playing a four, try to trade those two pawns, which is against the rules, which still might somehow work, but it's wrong. And after, let's say, bishop f8. Now, oh, wait a second. Bishop e7, he played. Check. You have to take. You have to take, otherwise, the pawn on a6 is under attack. Take, take. a5. You might think, wait a second, this is risky, I mean, I cannot calculate this, this is advanced stuff, he's gonna try to organize the pass pawn at the queen side. I mean, but this is, you have to calculate until 10, this is easy, easy stuff. No, no, not, not a 4. Or maybe a 4 actually still wins, by the way. F4. I think c6 is the easiest one. c6, here. Ah, I think he played b4, yeah. b4, c7. Here, take, a4, king d4, take, and that's it. When you see this position from afar, you know that you are going to take care of the queenside pawns, but he, the sole king, he cannot take those connected pawns. So let's say take, take, here, 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 here. a3 is no good because of king c3 and b4. Take, take, and that's the problem. That's the problem of the connect pass pawns. They they protect each other. So the pawn on f4 cannot be taken because the g5 pawn advances, and after king f5, there's no progress. The king can be wherever you want. Wherever you want, it doesn't matter. Those pawns are supporting each other, and thus you just take care of the queen side first and then you just come back so that's why it's so important that you can <laughs> you recognize the pawn end games are the easiest end games because you recognize this position is winning you just play knight c5 take take yeah for sure was winning probably as well but i think c6 c7 trade this and just play a four you recognize you're not gonna miss a a passed pawn which is gonna queen at the queen side and those two pawns they're gonna get they're gonna take care of themselves and that's it that's that's why it's so important all right let me check for more uh, this one i'm not gonna show you okay time for tragic comedies this time this time I'm going to be from the other side. <laughs> I'm going to be from the side of 
of the of the one who got gifted a gifted free half a point so this is my game again i'm showing right now my games and after that i'm gonna switch over again to dvoretsky's Ingram manual i think my games also can be quite instructive and the game obviously is a draw that there's nothing to be seen so i was trying very badly to push for the win my opponent was roman yezhov uh, experienced player from Estonia and I was pushing and pushing and pushing and I played here rookie for check the last check so the idea here that rook c4 gives nothing because of king d5 and this is going to be a draw spawn endgame many educated guys yeah I guess I have played so for example take take we can try to race, but we are going to be slow. So when we are having this position, yeah, and obviously we are not in time. Why this is um, important and what's the technique you can use in your games? Just count to 10 and compare the results. So for example, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So our score is nine. Let's check the opponent. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the last thing you need to do, and this is quite funny, I've seen it so many times. <laughs> when it comes to the pawn endgames, one of the players is doing like this. Here, here. Here, 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 here. And during the comparison, this is gonna drive you crazy. Just calculate the number of the moves. It's so simple. So if you have more moves than your opponent, obviously you're gonna make it in time. So again, it's nine against eight. Very quickly, you have to call, for example, you're playing a blitz game. You have something like 20 seconds on the clock. Imagine this position. You're playing this position. You have to make sure, can I play King E4 or not? You have 20 seconds on the clock. It's a very big decision. Either win or I lose. You don't trust. You don't throw a coin. Very simple calculate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That took me what? A couple of seconds to calculate this. Then I do exactly the same for my opponent. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Nope, I cannot do that. So it took me something like up to 10 seconds to do this. I still have 10 seconds to realize what I need to do, I probably just need to play king c3, just make a draw here. Instead, what happened in the game, I gave him a check and he played king f5. Suddenly he started to have illusions that he should be active and go for the h pawn, and he miscalculated. Now the question is, can I play rook c4? Now who is able to calculate this? Rook c4 and go for the pawn endgame. It's never about guessing. It's simply a mathematics calculate until 10. 7 pro black? Just a second, let's check it. So rook c4 takes takes. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. How many for white? How many for white? <laughs> Thank you, Paul, yeah. Yeah, this I go here, he goes there, I go here, he goes there. I actually have seen quite a number of experienced players doing this. It always makes me fun. During the game, they're doing like this. Here, 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 here. Or like the fingers, they're moving like this. <laughs> I just cannot stand it. Is it six or seven or eight? There's so many, so many... Yeah, those who correct correctly noted six how do you get six 43 <laughs> if you start with a4 so after king g4 one two three four five six that's it black is late black is simply late so apparently my opponent has miscalculated he thought that after rook c4 he's gonna trade 
trade here and he thought that automatically I'm going to go after the A pawn, something like B4 or King B4. And he had in his mind, he's gonna now play A4. Now he's gonna trick me, right? And after something like King B5 takes. Yeah, by the way, King C6 still draws because King A4 is just not too slow. We can calculate this. One, two, three, four, five, six, and already eight moves. I mean, this is way too much, way too much. But still, luckily, King B5 and King C6. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This is still a draw. So what he missed, he missed it. I can include A4. Stopping his idea to play A4 himself. And after King H4, here, he doesn't have to really take, here, take, whoops, not in time, not in that. So that was a big, big mistake, of course. I don't remember much about the circumstances. That was a classical game, but uh, that was directly linked with the idea that he simply missed the move a4 that's it yeah so after king g4 a4 here b4 and white is simply fast it always comes down to this long diagonal and always when i'm looking at this example i remember this very famous example from the movies searching for bobby fisher right you remember this uh a final example which was played between Poe against who was the main guy? I I don't remember who was the main guy. Those two little boys who were playing against each other, and the final motive was giving this check in the end, and the queen is uh, queen is lost. Always remember that. So this is quite easy stuff. Yeah, sure he was not happy about it. All right. So still tragic comedy. He could have easily made a draw before instead of this. Um, uh, king e5, king d5 is easy draw. Still after king e5, rook c4. This is still a possibility to make it right. I mean, sometimes when you make a mistake, you can still acknowledge, okay, I made a mistake. I realize I cannot play rook takes on c4 because now I see that after king g4, there is a4. Yeah, now I have to just give up the pawn. Maybe this is still, by the way, a draw after something like rook d5 check, king, I don't know, c3, and just play actively. Okay, but okay, I mean, this is not fun to find out, but still, this is not losing by force. Okay. Yeah, the f I thought the film was pretty epic. Maybe it didn't make much sense, but I liked it. I always liked the movie. Always liked it. All right, uh, more examples of how we can try to um, transfer, transform the position into a winning pawn endgame. The scene, yeah, the scene uh, from the movie uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer. There, th that was a tale of a small boy who was uh, trying to get better in chess and he was playing a final game against uh, a favorite. And somehow he beat him by this exactly the same idea of the queens are positioned on the same diagonal and the king is in front of it. Yeah, so for some reason I just remembered about it. So anyway, so about this position. After rook f, rook f8, rook f1. So the question is, black is obviously better. He is obviously better. The question is, can white play rook f1 can you do it now it's not about bobby i mean bobby wasn't even featuring in the movie it was about a boy a small boy it's a hollywood movie i believe right now it's available on netflix as well again since the recent success of the queen's gambit i bet all of you have seen queen's gambit already loved it yeah no, 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 there's no knight f4 threat. So this is all about the pawn's endgame. You have to recognize, can you go there or not? 
white here cannot go for this and reason and the reason do you what do you think is the reason why white cannot go for the pawn endgame here and he did the reason is i'm gonna draw it for you that's the reason white is going to be in a tsukzwang at some moment it's not obvious from afar but it is no not for b3 not for b3 so i just take knight e4 take and what my opponent had missed oh xostark <laughs> okay <laughs> I see that. So C takes, what he missed is that the king inevitably is going to go here and white is under a big threat to become in a tsukzwang. So that already is feeling like a tsukzwang. So for example, king e2, king g4, king f2, seemingly everything is fine. And yet, black plays either h5, either g6. This pawn is falling, and with that, it's falling the entire game. Why taking it with the c pawn is better than the e pawn? That's a very good question. Because white doesn't get access to the f4 square. Maybe this is also somehow winning. Just a second. Let me check. Take. Here. Here. Now, computer is convinced that this is a draw after g4. I cannot tell it immediately. It's not obvious to me. We can try to execute the same idea after c takes here, here, and g4. After king g5, king g3. Remember this little thing I mentioned to you about the opposition? It works also here. So after g6, here, now you see the difference. White doesn't have access to king e4. That's it. Yes. The e5 square takes away the f4 square. I mean the e5 pawn takes away the f4 square. So king e4 is impossible. So something like uh, g3 and just king h3. Or king, or king g5 doesn't really matter. So these pawns are falling. So the mistake was for white not recognizing this position from afar. I mean, he is already worse, but rook f1 cannot be played. And again, this is why it's so important that you recognize those pawn endgames at the start. You know some basic principles, you realize um, the opposition, the distant opposition, and that sometimes you can transpose your game into a pawn endgame, which you know. And my opponent did not. Yep. Well, of course, depends on your memory, uh, Lolly. All right. Okay, this is going to be fun. The next game was I was quite proud of. Um, I'll tell you honestly, it doesn't start. It doesn't really start as a pawn end game. Um, this was what I played in 2000 and oh my goodness, so far away, 2001. 20 years ago, unbelievable. I was playing it in the World Junior Championships uh, against Michael Royce. He is right now a renowned author, well known, extremely strong player, who was a top 100 player in the world. And right now he's written some wonderful books. Yes, yes, the books, of course, and he's a great coach, great guy. Totally recommend. And I was playing against him with Black, and at the time I was. Um, international master i think and he was i don't remember maybe grandmaster already and i was quite proud of this game at the time because i had limited limited knowledge about end games i didn't study end games i thought i mean the end games is for the week i mean who studies the end games right I mean, just i'll do something more fun watch a movie <laughs> so that was my thought process at the time so i didn't really um, focus too much on um, the Ninja book. Okay. Yeah, maybe. So at the time I realized that this position is dangerous for me. So I decided to 
simplify the position and sacrifice the pawn. So what I did, so these are big weaknesses. I sacrifice the pawn, force the queen trade, take, take, and I calculated by force that I'm going to take the A pawn for the D pawn. White is better, white is better, definitely. Hey, Steve. I trade these pawns, and now I trade the A pawns. And I know that this endgame, 3 versus 2 rooks, is a draw. I know this. I didn't know yet how to draw this, but I knew the evaluation. So that's why I sacrifice the pawn. I simplify the position to defend more easily. So it doesn't matter. I mean, we are playing this rook endgame for a long time. He was trying to pressure me. He was trying to pressure me, blah, 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 blah. Now comes the critical moment. Can I play king f7 or not? Do you know it? Would you play it? <laughs> you just have to know it. I mean, some things you just have to know it. And um, as it happens, I knew. Could be quite difficult to calculate this, but still, if you know some basic stuff, I mean, maybe you can calculate it. <laughs> no? You think I, I cannot go there? King f7? So king f7 and rook f4. Yes, that's the point. Can we do this? Can we do this? Because the alternative is cutting off the king even further from those past pawns. Super dangerous. So it's, again, guys, this is not a coin flip. You just have to know it. Can you or cannot? And imagine at this moment when you're playing the game, you're just biting. Ah! Why didn't I study the end game when I should have? Why did I waste that time watching some movies and doing some ridiculous stuff when I could have studied a couple of hours some important rook end games? And you won't believe at which critical moments it pays off. Well, I did. I did know this end game. Ah, uh, it's not so simple. It's I'm afraid it's not so simple. King G8, King H8 just loses. <laughs> okay, it can be done. It can be done. Yeah, I'm already jumping for it. So King F7. Here, here, here. And actually, this position is quite simple. But you just have to know one. No, you can. You can. You just have to know one basic principle. Never let the king to g6. That's it. That's it. Never let the king to g6. If you know this very little principle, you can already safely go to this position. That's going to be one principle. And the second one, I'm going to show you after a moment. So, so for example, let's say king e8. King f5 being ready to play king f7. So let's say what happens. What happens? So he tried to outflank me. Outflanking doesn't work. H6, G6 is gonna be easy. Yeah, he's trying to he's trying to set up a distant opposition, but it doesn't work. Not for this one. So I'll just show you what happens. If, what happens if he plays, let's say here, here. I mean, I can I can actually safely play King F7 as well here, because after King F5 I have G6. This is quite important resource to have in your disposal, so it's just impossible, just impossible for the White King to get to G6. But what happens if I let the King to G6? Let's say, let's say I don't realize there's this move G6 and I play here. You think, ah, this is just a draw. It's not a draw. And King F7 is a stalemate, right? Nope. Check. Here. And simple King G6. There you go. That's losing. So you cannot do that. Uh, let's say I'll play not... What did I play there? Um, 
up like in GF. Here and King H8. And this is what I think Lali suggested this. Uh, why we cannot play take on H6? Uh, because this is losing. This is losing. Yeah, and you are forced to play King F7. This is the position which I mentioned in the beginning of the stream. You're losing. You are forced out of G8 and uh, what wins? Sveitsins? Sveitsins? Doesn't work. Yeah, so let's say we are trying to hide the king in the corner. So King G8, King H6, King H8. It seems like a good strategy because after H6, H6, there is a lovely response, King G8. H takes is a stalemate, H7, King H8, White loses the spawn, and this is going to be a draw. No, I'm not going to participate in puzzle competition, unfortunately. Maybe next time. So, the right solution here is we are not allowing the king to get to g6, and I knew that during the game. Ah! Oh. Well, then you're then you're at the right time and right place, Steve, because we that's what we have right now, upon a king endgame. <laughs> right. So this is what happened. He tried to outflank me. Tried to outflank. Tried to outflank. Tried to outflank. Here does work. Does work. And here and here and finally, he played g6. Now. Do you know this endgame? This is super, super important endgame. How to defend here? Because seemingly what is going to progress and... So the idea is this. Here. 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 Whoops. Oops. So the idea is that after G takes, King F7, G7 promotes, but that's King G8, and that's it. <laughs> that's a stalemate. So what you need to know, what you need to know, King F8 is a stalemate as well. That's a stalemate. This is easy theoretical draw. With a pawn on g6, that's easy theoretical draw. So this is why my opponent was trying not to play it immediately. He tried to set up some distant opposition. He tried to force me to make some kind of a mistake. But he wouldn't play immediately g6. He had to try g6 at some point, And after g6, I just hide in the corner. Not before. The pawn is on g6. Because if I'm again, if I'm... If I'm again playing, I'm moving the key in the corner immediately. This is lost. Does it work? There needs to be a pawn on g6. Again. g6. Hide in the corner. Here, here, h6. And again, the final little important nuance is king G8. And now you just take the pawn on h6, and that's it. And h7 is a stalemate. So, super, super important game, and I was quite proud that I managed to play it so correctly. That was 10, 20 years ago, and I had limited knowledge about endgames, and this one and some, I somehow knew. <laughs> Alright. Um... More examples of... Okay, this is going to be a final example of tragic comedies from my games. And then we are going to just completely switch over to Dvoretsky's remaining stuff. I mean, the pawn endgames, there's so many of them. We can talk... I can talk about it for days, probably. Super, super interesting. And this is going to be a game. Final game. From my arsenal. So... I was playing this game against an international master from Poland, Oskar Wieczorek. I believe now he's a grandmaster. It's not many years ago, something like seven, eight years ago. Rapid game, European Rapid Championships. And this is the position. I'm playing with white. 
So black is thinking. Black is thinking. I'm the defender. I'm defending because white has the outside pass pawn. Because if we remove the queens off the board, it's extremely risky for black. I'll just show you one example. Let's say I'll do something like something ridiculous. Let's say queen b6. Check. Takes. Let's say here. That's maybe not exactly accurate. I just again want to show you the idea. Some basic stuff, really. Okay, didn't really work. I was trying to set up somehow. So the idea, the luxury of having an outside pass pawn is that you're forcing your opponent to take care of it first and you are having the entire other side with many pawns at your disposal. So that's his idea, that's the that's in theory at least the idea. Not always it works, but everybody is afraid of those outside pass pawns because I can always switch to some pawn endgames, then I'm gonna sacrifice the B pawn and at the same time with the king get to the king side and take all of those pawns at the king side. That's at least in theory. So this is the backstory, and this is what my opponent knows. So he's thinking, wait a second. Mark Dvoretsky also says you need to trade pawns if you are the weaker side. Now the question is for you, can black play g5 and trade a couple of pawns? Because that's logical. Oh, I'm sorry, not queen b6. Uh, yeah, the queen is still standing on b5. Sack a pound together by king. Not sure if that's relevant here. So the question is G7, G5. Can we do this? I'll put it from the black perspective so that maybe it's easier for you to understand. It's always about the pawn endgames. Remember, guys, you have to know those pawn endgames. Are you guessing, Steve? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm getting some feedback that the Vretsky's Zeniga manual is slightly too complex. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's more for advanced uh, player. But I'm an advanced player, so I've been using it myself. Yeah, you can read it without a coach. But there are also simpler books, some one kind of important endgames that you need to know. Who is the author? Somebody mentioned it. It is hard. It is hard. I can guarantee you that it is a hard book. I mean, I was trying to study the entire book from the first page until the end page. I was trying to do everything. And I did the first 50 pages. Whew. That was difficult. Yeah, and after that, I decided just to take the most important stuff that I like. And I read the book diagonally about the most important things and I took the best for myself. 100 Endgames. Okay, okay, I'll try to remember. Who was the author? Jesus de, de Villa. Okay. Jesus de Villa. Try to remember that. Yes, hope noob test. Exactly. White gets a pass pawn to h5 as well. So this is the so-called... I don't know how it's in English, actually. In Russian, there is a very nice term. Uh, uh, very nice uh, title for that. It's the so-called trousers. Yeah, In Russian, they call it the trousers. So what's a trouser, right? There's the left one, there's the right one. So that's exactly what happened. No, 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 no. After g5 first. This is a big mistake. F takes. H takes already is a big mistake because black had realized the queen trade is coming. And that's it. That's it. This endgame now is lost. So it's so difficult uh, from afar to see that black 
is un oh okay new arrows okay so black is unable to stop these two con uh, two pawns and those double connected pawns at the center they don't matter and this is quite tricky actually because everybody loves the connected pants uh the the connected pawns but at the pawn end games different rules apply because if you'd have this position let's say in an opening you'd have some a lot of pieces a lot more pawns and black would have those e pawns against the c5 pawn and h4 pawn so black would be probably better but in the pawn end game different rules apply and black king is unable to stop these pawns Yes, white has to know to capture away from the center in order to create an outside pass pawn. Because my opponent automatically thought that here after g takes, h takes, h takes, and we are going to continue to play it. He just missed this moment that this already is going to be a pawn endgame. So f takes and that's it. All right. So that was the final game from my games. I want to continue with some important stuff from the Vretsky's Endgame Manual. Uh, just a second. There was something I wanted to show you. Some extremely nice stuff. I'll just try to find it. Try to find it first. Okay, L let's move on with the next one. Yeah, GMs also make mistakes. I already showed a couple of ma mistakes I made myself. More than one, actually. So the next one is going to be the breakthrough. And this is a classic. And everybody probably knows it let me just set it up so <laughs> yeah so most of you probably already realize recognize this position Ah, yeah, Steve, you already know that. Yeah, this is a classic. This is a classic. So again, I'll start with the basics, but explain more difficult ones after that. So again, white wins. If white is the move, white wins. B6 and either A takes C6 and A6 or C takes and A6. Yeah, this is quite a basic stuff. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Because it really depends where's the king. If the king can get closer to that passed pawn, maybe it doesn't work. Yeah, this is crazy, but this is quite important uh, strategy. Because white sacrifices two pawns in order to promote the pawn. But now I'm going to show you a more tricky one. A more tricky one. Now that you know this stuff. Uh, where was it? Just a second. Okay, here we go. And just a second, it's gonna be a pawn end game. Big surprise there. Unfortunately, I have to click every single time for the pawn. Cannot multi click. And why does the move? Eight pawns against eight pawns. <laughs> okay, why does the move? First, before we create a passed pawn at the king's side, because the idea again is the same. We have the pawn majority at the king side, you want to create a passed pawn 
So for example, I want to play King g3, King e4, h4, g5, trade this pawn, and then just take these pawns. Just take them. They're mine. A PGM4, but yeah, maybe. What what about c5? Very good, Steve. Yes, you have to fix the queen side for, for, uh, pawns first, but why is that? We recognize the breakthrough. We recognize it. So after king g3, it's going to be c4, here, and here. And king, king e5 actually is risking to be king g5, king h4. So white has to play h4. Here, here, here. Yeah, and white is... And black is simply creating a passed pawn at the queen side. So the correct move is c4. Yeah, c4, sacrifice the pawn. It doesn't matter how many pawns black has on the c file. I can even gift you one more on c7 if you really want. <laughs> doesn't really matter. So b takes, fixes those pawns. I can play first c3, I can play first a4, and then only create a passed pawn and just take these pawns. So that's it. So if black plays b4, there is no way black is going to create a passed pawn. So this is what happened after c4, whatever black does here, a4 as long as white doesn't take on on b5 he's doing great yeah so this is why i really love chess in comparison to checkers i mean no offense to checkers but in checkers you're forced to take you have to take in chess i mean you don't have to take you play in, play c4 and you have to take on b5 and black doesn't have to take on c4 yeah you don't play a3 of course you don't play a3 just play king g3 king g3 h4 king king f4 g5 just chick, 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 chick take everything that's the beauty that's the power of the outside passed pawn but in order in the process of creating it we recognize the creating the breakthrough hello stevim how are you um okay this is gonna be funny more tragic comedies more tragic comedies King is on e3, king is on e5. Black is to move. So, white has outside pass pawn. Looks dangerous. Okay. So, white has the outside pass pawn. And black is thinking, wait a second. Now I'm the weaker side. I have to trade as many pawns as I can. The question is, can I play g5? So g6, g5 is the big move. We need to understand, can we do this or not? Everybody is thinking very hard, I imagine. Absolutely play for the draw because white has the outside pass pawn. Because if you are going to play with the king here, the white king is trying to force us back and just take these pawns. Just take them. Just take them. We're absolutely trying to make a draw. F5 is losing. So this still is a draw, but G5 loses. And this is a nice trick to know. <laughs> what did I mention about those trousers? That's it. G4, a very nice trick to know. And white is creating yet another pass pawn at the queen side. 
So of course, black was expecting to play h takes f takes, trade those pawns and yeah, and play h5 next move. It doesn't matter how many pawns you have here, they don't matter. What matters is the b-pawn and h-pawn. They're separate pawns and the king is unable to stop them. All right. Uh, there was uh, one very nice technique in this regard I wanted to show you. Just a second. Maybe I already skipped that. Oh, here it is. Here it is. How to make sure your, your king is taking care of those past pawns. So this is extremely nice theory. Let me just show you an example. Just a second. So we are going to look at it from the white's perspective. Oh, or maybe blacks. Okay, it doesn't matter. So it is. Doesn't really matter who is to move. And okay, here this black to move doesn't matter. So the question is, this is the so-called floating square. The answer to the previous example is no, you cannot play g5 because it loses to g4. And white creates another pass pawn. So g5 would be a very, very big mistake. So here the question is, the black king obviously cannot deal with those outside pawns. I mean, h5, g6, they're connected pawns, and the black king just cannot take care of them. So the question is, can the white king take care of the a5 and c5 pawn? And it might seem, it's like this. Here, 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 here. Okay, maybe I make it, maybe I don't. But there's a very simple principle. What you need to understand, uh, it's the so-called floating square. Yeah, now that you calculate, you see that black wins. But why is that? What is a floating square? This is the so-called floating square. And what you have to understand, if the bottom line, if it touches the final line, black wins. It's as simple as that. You don't need to calculate this. It depends how far the square goes diagonally until the end. And this is how you can check it out. So again, let me draw to you another example. Yes, you cannot. If the, if the final line of the box touches the final promoting line, you're not holding the pawns. So again, let's say what is move does, doesn't really matter. If white is to move here, you cannot take here, here, and the box is even smaller. Let me show you another example. I'll try to draw it myself. Not from the book this time. Again, the same pawns. The king is going to be here. And the pawns are going to be... Just a second. In theory, it should work. I have not tested it. How does it work, actually? I wanted to be really smart. I'm not sure if it's going to work. And what is to move? Okay, okay. This is still a draw. Now, now we see... Now we see the floating square. How do we draw this? How do we draw this? Yep, king c5. Because again, king b6 loses e5. And now the floating square reaches the final rank. And that's it. So the only move is king c5. a5 is losing because I am in time. 
And this is the so-called square, the so-called square of the past pawn. I make it in time, I'm in time, I'm in time, I'm in time. So that, I think I should have explained it before. It, it really helps to see from afar. Um, if the king is in the square of the outside pass pawn, maybe I should have started with this in just a second. Just a second. So for example, So how do we realize if this is a draw or not? So let's say black is the move. If you're gonna cook like this, 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 here, here, he goes here, he goes here, he goes here, this is gonna be quite awkward. So you just position yourself, the king on g3, and draw a square. So why is the move? You are outside of the square. It's obvious you're not gonna make it. You have to be inside the square to take care of this pawn. So you can try to calculate this, but what is going to be slightly faster? I'm missing one tempo. So let's imagine, let's imagine the same position, or maybe a different position. It's going to save you quite a lot of time. We have the same position. Let's say this time it's going to be here, um, here, and let's say king here. And what is the move? Yes, if you can get a square, that is the question. That is the question. So again, b4, here, and there you go. By diagonally, you check if the king is getting into square. That's how you know it. It's so much easier. Otherwise, here, 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 here. Just draw the square in your mind. You see diagonally it's making in the so-called virtual square. That's it. You can be sure you're going to make it. So I should have started with this and then move on with the floated square. So let me show you more examples of floated square. Uh, is, for example, let's say the same pawns here. Okay, maybe let's position the king here. And why does the move? So how this game is supposed to end? Again, you are asking yourself, where's the floating square? Are we are drawing this in our mind? So let me draw it for you. We are easily getting in the floating square. So after king d5, here, we force the other pawn to move. Now we just go back. <laughs> now we just go back and take care of this pawn. The black king is powerless to do anything because he cannot take an h5. Because the g pawn advances. Now we just go here and we can check if I'm in the square. Yeah, I'm in the square. I mean, more than that even. I'm in reserve. More than enough. So the white king takes care of those outside. I mean, not so outside, but those past pawns alone. And if you can draw yourself this floating square in your mind from afar, you can very quickly identify if this is a playable position or not. I can try to set up some more difficult ones, maybe. Let's say... Okay, again, the same position. Yeah, but probably not further than that. Maybe... Okay, maybe I should just remove these pawns. Uh, that's not, not really a real position anyway, but...
Uh, theoretically, we should be able to hold this. <laughs> but I can imagine this to happen in real game because you also need to position the opponent's king somewhere. So that's how you draw the floating square. And yeah, black has no king. <laughs> White win. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay, okay. All right. A more tricky example from the floating square. I'm going to show you an actual game which was played by Alexander Halefman, really a wonderful person and a great expert when it comes down to the end games. And just a second. So it was this end game. So Alexander Halefman is the uh, FIDE world champion of 1999, I think so at least, if I'm not mistaken, by year. He won the FIDE knockout world championship. I know him in person very well. He's super friendly, super nice guy. So what is the move? Uh, Steve, you're referring to the previous example, right? So here again, it's all about the floating square. I mean, this is an easier example because white doesn't really have anything to do. Because he has already stepped on the so-called mind square. So the e4 square is the mind square. As soon as he leaves it, he loses the f5 pawn. So obviously it's h6, right? h6, g takes. And now, how do we make sure that the king is going to take care of the e5 and h6 pawn is we draw the square. That's how you do it. That's how you do it and again from afar you're seeing that the black king cannot take the pawn on a 5 because the g pawn promotes. Very slowly, very carefully white advances. Here e4 loses. I mean, everything loses, but to show you an example, c5 just loses time, doesn't give you anything. Yeah, this just drops the pawn on the spot. And uh, let's say here. And now the last tricky moment in this floating square uh, example and theory, we remember about a mind square. So black has a mind square where he doesn't want to step. Can you can you identify which is the mind square for black? This is a tricky example, but I, I love it. Which is the square where black doesn't want to step on? F6. Now there is another. F6 he was just just there. So white wants to play king h4. King h4 in order to take the pawn on h5 and after e4 just go back king g3, king e king f4, king e4. H6. No 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 no. Hey Bertsmith, how are you? It's h6. So if you are gonna play king h4, it's just king h6. There's no progress. We have to go back. So the correct move is to play king h3. E4 drops a pawn. Take, and we are in the square. So, King H6, King H4. Black is losing a tempo. We go back. And this is something which I didn't mention to you about. Is the so-called triangulation. Now we again play King H3. King H4. Now this pawn has moved, we go here. And the king's in the square. I think that's a lovely example, really. Nasty stuff, right, yeah, sure. But uh, if you, again, if you understand the principle of the floating square, this is so much easier. Otherwise, imagine, imagine you're playing this position. Can you calculate this? 
uh, the opposition, no, I would say it was a mix of the floating square together with some mind squares and the squares. Yeah, can you calculate this in the head? Imagine you're sitting this, uh, sitting in a game. You have something like five minutes on the clock because you don't have so much time in the end of the game. And you have to see, you have to understand. And no person in the world will calculate this in a couple of minutes. Because eventually you are creating your opponent, those trousers, to outside pass pawns. So if you don't understand the principle of the floating square, it's so difficult to go for this. So, and this is essentially what, what Halifman did. I mean, I don't think he really calculated everything in, in his head. He just realized, being such a great player, that this is a floating square. The king is going to take care of the e5 and h5 square. So it's not really a risk for him. Maybe he did some basic calculation. And king g7, king h6, he has this triangulation. Extremely very nice way how to lose tempo with king h3. Here, here, here. He can continue this forever. So, for example, I could set up the same position. Um, let me try to do it extremely tricky. So that you understand it better. I'll, I'll make an artificial position. The same position. Okay, something like this. This is gonna be ridiculous. So again, you'll understand the same principle. The same principle. These pawns at the queen side, they don't matter at all. Despite the fact that white is down so many pawns, he's winning. By the way, engine is saying that <laughs> black is winning. That's quite funny, actually. Black is losing this. He does, doesn't understand it. So floating square here here king g7 now what do we do here first we play king h3 first we play king h3 force the king go here here now this pawn moves i go here force the king go here You understand the point, right? <laughs> so this is gonna be go forever, 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 until all the pawns at the queen side are blocked and black will have to move those E pawn or H pawn, we take care of them. And then finally, once the king takes care of the E5 e pawn and H5 pawn, we advance the F and G pawns. So that's quite a tricky stuff, this triangulation, king h3, king h4, king, h, king g3, king h3, king h4, king g3. Yeah, so I just draw this manually myself, uh, using uh, uh, Halifman's uh, game. It's a nice way how to fool the engine. The engine doesn't understand it, it's clueless. Because engines, they are built by calculating until a specific move. So for example, I'm setting up a position and Let's say the engine is calculating up the move 20. So what does it mean? It means the engine sees first 20 moves. He doesn't see the 21st move. So if you have the mate on the 21st move, engine doesn't see that. So after you'll make the first move, engine is gonna reach the depth of 20. Oh, there's a mate on move 21. So this is how engines essentially work. They don't understand. They're just machines. They calculate everything. Oh, thank you, Bertspin. So that was the principle of the floating square. Hope you understand it at least better than before. Um, a couple of interesting, um, couple of interesting uh, principles I would like to mention about the pawn endgames is also this one, which I didn't mention. Uh,
let's say f and h pawn doesn't really matter which pawns let's position the king here and the king here a black's to move do you know how this position is supposed to end i mean of course with connected pawns uh, which help each other we already know that it doesn't matter where the king is positioned here they're not connected and the king supposedly is well within the floating square but this is something else rook pawn and bishop pawn endgame steve why i think in general it's like this we hate what we don't understand right <laughs> I don't hate them. I've studied them. Trixie! Talk about rook endgames. I'll tell you everything about being tricky. Endgames is an entirely different world in chess. So this is why... I'm not sure if you're aware of this. In Russian school... I mean, every Russian speaking is probably... Gonna relate to that. Take the youngsters to the endgame. <laughs> Because they just don't understand it, they don't have the knowledge, and how should they? So, endgames have a completely different chess. Every single tempo matters, a lot of different principles. It's not opening, it's not pendulum game, it's completely something else, a different science, so to speak. Yeah, this is a win for white, but it's still supposedly the king is in the floating square. It is supposedly in the floating square, right? So why, why this is different? This is an exception, because after king g6, the king cannot promote, I mean, cannot uh, advance. So king f4, obviously the h pawn advances. <laughs> yeah, so you cannot advance, and if the king is going to try to take the other one, there's a five. So this is quite tricky, tricky stuff, and extremely important to know that these pawns which are divided by one line they're still taking a good care of each other so the black king cannot come closer king f6 is h6 and king h6 is f6 and this is how they're helping each other <laughs> okay so let me show you another example so this is gonna be quite tricky Um. Oh, just a second, I think it's here, here, here. Yes, the floating square doesn't apply, apparently when there's only one file apart. Dvoretsky doesn't really state this. This is what we can derive ourselves from what we have studied. As you saw, the king cannot take care of those pawns. So for example, yeah, maybe I should have started with this. So for example, um, I would set up a different position, just a second. So let's say again the same pawns, which are taking good care of each other, and these pawns. So this is quite paradoxical. This position, with the pawns on a5 and c5, this is a draw. Because none of the sides can make a progress. I mean king a4 is c4, king c4 is a4. So this is a draw. But what's paradoxical is that this is... Winning for what? I mean, the pawns are supposedly more further from each other, but the king is within the floating square. And the floating square doesn't reach the final line. That's quite interesting one, actually. Okay. Again, the floating square was here. You remember, right? Okay, let me show you the f this one. So 
So here the blacking is in danger. Uh, because with the square pass pawn, um, people understand when the king is chasing just one pawn. Typically, typically when you talk with somebody, okay, the king is in the square. Uh, they understand that the king can catch this pass pawn. Yeah, square is something else. It's very similar. I mean, a floating square is typically used for two pawns, not for one. Okay, this position. You know what's funny about this position is whoever to move is to win. <laughs> so it's not really a real position, it's just uh, a composed position, but still it's important. So the black king, the black king cannot move, as you can see. Otherwise, one of the pawns at once is king f7 is h7 and this pawn cannot be stopped. And king h7 is f7 and f pawn is going to be promoted. So the black king needs to take care of those three pawns. So how do we do that? How do we take care of those pawns? Any bright ideas? There's not really so many moves here. So I'm pretty sure you're going to guess it sooner or later. No, 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 no. What is the move? What is the move? White, 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 white has to move. If black has to move, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna find it. King b2, king b1. There's a lot of squares. So king b2 is a mistake, unfortunately. Those who said it's king b2, it's a mistake. So why is that? Now again, one move wins, all of the other loses. <laughs> B3. And what is in a Tsukzwang? He cannot move. That's it. So king king a3 is c3, this pawn promotes. King c3 is a3, this pawn promotes. And king b1 doesn't really help because this is essentially the same that's happening to black, but a1, c1, and queen. Yeah, but this is lost for black. This is lost for black. If white plays the correct move, king b1. And the point is here, it's all about who is to move here. So after b3, we just gave a tempo for black. <laughs> and black loses. I mean, he cannot move with the king. a3, all of the queen side or c3, all the queen side pawns lose. And the black king will have to move and white simply promotes. So this is quite an amazing study. That is strange, that is strange. You know, chess endgames is all about strange. I mean, the normal rules, they don't apply. The Tsukzwang, the so-called no move rule, is so important in porn endgames, like nowhere else. And for example, after King B1, if A3, King A2, here, here, that's it. And that's the difference. And that's the difference between a win and a loss. Show fully? Okay. So for example, c3, here. These pawns cannot move. I'll just take them. a3 here. They cannot move. The king cannot move. So let's say either a2 or c2. Take here, here, here. White is not in a Tsukzwang. Black is. White can just play King B1, King, King B2, King C1, King B2, King C1. Black cannot just click. I'm standing, I'm doing nothing. He has to move. He has to move with the king. Ah, uh, this is, um, yeah, there is a dip. There is no draw. Yeah, somebody has to lose. Either it's white or black. Yeah, this is just a one study, isn't it? So king b1 wins, king b2 loses, that's it. Why do you think there is the saying, take the youngsters to the end game? That's the reason. This is exactly the reason. And uh, many experienced players often, for example, I'm an experienced grandmaster, I'm playing against 
a youngster, he's very good calculator. He calculates everything. He's super good at openings. So what I do, I take him to the endgame. I take him to the endgame where he has to show this understanding, these principles, the floating squares. Uh, this is something which maybe for a grandmaster is basic stuff, but for a youngster who just started to play good chess quite recently, it's difficult for him to show this. Yes, that's an alternate universe, exactly. Yeah, it's very nicely put, Steve. All right. Um, let me check if I miss something. Obviously, there's more than this. A lot more. Um, okay, okay, this one is funny, actually. About the acti activity of the king. Activity of the king. Uh, I'll allow you... To guess. Just a second. I'm setting up yet another endgame. And uh, the question is going to be this. Now, please think about this. Which side you would like to play? I'm not going to tell who it is to move. Which side do you like more? Oh, what is this weird songs? I think Pretzel is running out with the good songs. Oh my goodness. White, black, white, black. But I'm more interested, why? Why is that? That's black. White has C3. Very good. So white can see three, creating an outside pass pawn. What is that? again? Just let me change the. I'll switch over a little to the classical music just a second. I think they're running after the. Just a second now. Yeah, some weirdness started to... Okay, here we go. Some classical stuff. Now I have news for you guys. Those who picked white. White is losing by force. <laughs> white is losing by force. Can you imagine this? <laughs> okay, black is the move. Black is the move. <laughs> This is uh, choppy, you think? Just a second. Are you sure? No, it's somebody else. Henry Purcell. I don't know who is that. Who is that? <laughs> okay. So, black plays king c7, not c5. And now comes the big shocker move. Is it too loud? How is that? Is this better? So after king c7, the real question is what we're missing here. Let me switch the table. C3. Okay. C3. Because the idea is to create this outside pass pawn. You're welcome. Shopping funeral march. I cannot find it so quickly. But here comes the sh real shocker. Black doesn't take on C3. Oops. So what is this? I mean, what is simply simply up a pawn, right? Here. Do you recognize that Sukzwang? <laughs> this is this is one of them. 
and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that white has the outside pass pawn. Had we moved this position by one square back, the king is on b5, the white king is on b3. White wins. Here white loses. Yes, because black is going to take the d4 pawn, those two connected pawns, they're gonna take good care of each other and black is just gonna take the pawn on a2 at some point. So for example, here, 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 here. Okay, maybe king b4 as well, doesn't really matter. The king is hiding here and these pawns, they're marching forward. That's it. But I mean, from afar, from afar, if you have to pick a position here, obviously it looks like white is doing great, right? White is losing. So that's quite, quite tricky stuff, really. Okay. Um. I'll try to remember. Do you know this famous uh, study by Richard Reti? Uh, probably you know that. Uh, just a second, because I'm already about to finish. I mean, there's so many ideas. I would love to show you more. Probably I have to do another bootcamp on pawns at some point later. Ah, uh, you know this one. Yes. White is escaping with the draw. Unbelievable. Oh, I mean, white is behind the past pawn. By two moves. The h5, h4, h3. So this is where black is moving. And this is where white is moving. And seemingly the black king is taking care of the pawn. I have seen this. Yeah, this is a classic. This is a, one of the most famous studies by Richard Reti. A chess legend of the early 20th century. Yeah. King g7. Here. Oh, I misplayed. <laughs> I misclicked it. After h4, king f6. h3. The idea is to play... Just a second. Uh, what was it? King e6. I should have should have put the position correctly. Okay, here, 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 and here. Yeah, I'm doing this from the memory, of course. Oh, two kings. Okay, not two kings. Okay. Yeah, two kings is gonna be too much, right? So what is the move? He goes here. Again. Oh my goodness, I'm getting tired probably. Getting tired. Uh, this was a long day. And it is white to move. Yeah, everything seems to be correct. And king g7. Draws. Yeah, it was wrongly set up because the last time I was uh, showing the position from black's perspective. And after h4, king f6. h3, king e7. This pawn advances. So after king b6, king e5, if the king takes here, if h3, king d6. So this is quite a lovely example, and probably you haven't seen this one, and I'll probably finish the stream by doing this. I just need to find it. I think it was in the book. The same idea. The same idea. Just a second. Ah, uh, there's so many pawn in games. Many, many, many of them. I've, I wanted to show you a couple of more of them. Oh, where did I miss that, actually? Where did I miss that? Uh... Ah, oh, here it is, here it is. Yes, uh, the study by Sarachev. Do you know that? <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Oh. Okay, and... So this is going to be the final position of the boot camp. If you know the Reti's idea, you can find a solution. White plays and draws. So white promotes here. This is the endgame sorcery, that's what it is. How do you draw this? Because seemingly black is just up a piece. C8 queen. King e6 is king d5. No, oh, sorry, king e4. King d6. King d6, I just play here. Right, so the correct move is King c8. It's paradoxical. King c8 and after b5. And seems, what is this? I mean, the pawn is running. You remember Reddy's idea. This is crazy. It might seem, wait a second, the game is over, right? I mean, the pawn is at once, like the bishop holds. <laughs> oh, you cannot play b3 because the bishop is under attack. Or on the board, unreal. Unreal. I mean, if, if you're having something like this in an actual game, you have to find King C8. That is unreal. It takes a pure genius to find something like that. There have been some situations like that. Yeah, so King C8. Force the pawn here to go King D7 here. King E6 King e here. And King E5. And the bishop goes here. King here. Here. Sacrifice the pawn. And just take it. So that's quite a, quite an amazing example using exactly the same Reti's idea. Yeah, that was Richard Reti originally with this idea with the king on h8, king g7, king f6, king e5, and doing two things at the same time, advancing the pawn at the queen side, and this is exactly the same idea, only slightly different execution, but still extremely nice. Okay, guys. Okay. I mean, guys, this was super, super fun and super entertaining, and. Uh, Probably one of my one of my best boot camps, I imagine. We managed to cover so many uh, theoretical stuff in these three and a half hours. Hey, McBurnout! Uh, why see it? Queen is why see it? Queen is losing. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, it's losing because the simple bishop check here, and you cannot eliminate the b pawn. That's why it's not working. Yes, this is going to YouTube, of course. I'll upload it to something like uh, one week. Again, I'd like to remind that all of my channel subs, they gain access to the archives. In the archives or the so-called video of the month, all of my stream archives are available immediately. So if you're a sub, you can get access to it right away. But I mean, I'm still uploading at the moment all of it at YouTube after some delay. Yeah, no, no. It, it's there, it's still not just uh, uh, available. It's gonna be there, it's gonna be there. So I would like to always to make for my uh, very loyal subs it a little more special. Yeah, videos on demands on Twitch, so the subs can access it right away. Uh, my schedule is uh, that this Sunday I will have the next stream. It's going to be Arena of my chess club. So the club, you probably, most of you are already in it, is here. And uh, from this club, I'm going to organize an arena of 3 minutes plus 1 second. This Sunday, starting uh 3.30 p.m. Latvian time, that's GMT plus 2. 
the time, the correct time is in the club's page. In just a second, you can find it. The topic? The topic is the arena. <laughs> we are gonna play Blitz finally. So today we just talked all, only about theoretical stuff about the pawn end games. On Sunday, I finally want to play something. I want to outplay you guys. <laughs> anyway, or at least you'll have have the chance to play against me. And uh, just don't beat me. <laughs> just don't beat me. Don't upset me. Okay, I'm just kidding. Of course, you can if you can do that. 1.30 p.m. London time. I think so. I think so. <laughs> okay. So, that was pretty good. Let me check if there's somebody still there. Uh, where I could raid you to. Do you have any preferences? Let me check. As you can see... Oh, you cannot see. You couldn't really see. There's... Some people who I follow on Twitch. 30 hours of chess to watch. Okay, good for you. Danya. Danya. Chess Dojo or Danya. Chess Dojo, actually, yeah, maybe. Danya has... What? Let, let's just check them, what they're doing. Just a second. Uh, he's playing uh, some hyper bullet. Well, maybe. Let me check what just Dojo is doing. Seven out of ten. Okay. And there's also Alex Astane. Or some tricks there that he wanted to do. And hashtag chess also potentially. Well, what do you think? I mean, I'm going to select somebody. Somebody you want to raid, I'm going to raid. Should have created the poll, probably. Alreza Firuja is streaming as well. If we could put the pawn on That's definitely not Alreza here. That's somebody else. Astanek. Yeah, okay, then let's just raid Alex. I mean, he's a super fun guy. I mean, I had the pleasure to work with him um, previously. Comment in his games. Okay. Okay, let you raid over to Alex's channel. Just a second. I hope you're going to appreciate it. So thank you again, guys, for being here. Um... Uh, my next stream is going to be this Sunday, uh, the arena of my chess club, and the next bootcamp is going to be next week, okay? Take care, have fun, enjoy Alex's stream, and again, I'll try to remind you, my sponsor is Surfshark. If you can support me, you can also uh, consider to purchase Surfshark, if you need a VPN anyway. <laughs> okay, take care, goodbye. Have a good evening.